Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. I'd like to say we'll get a full house today. No apologies been received from MSPs and we'll move straight on to agenda item one, which is City Region deal Deals. Uh, can I welcome Patrick Wiggins, Director, Ayrshire Growth Deal, Douglas Duff, Head of Economic Development and Environmental Services, Falkirk Council, Philip Ford, Regional Skills Planning Lead, and Paul Zealy, Regional Skills Planning Lead, Skills Develop Scotland. And, um, oh, my apologies. Uh, have I missed something? Oh, it's okay. I was going to say, I promise you, uh, I understand it's been indicated you might want to make some uh, brief opening remarks before we move to, to, to questions. So, in your hands, gentlemen, who'd like to go first? Mr. Mr. Wiggins. Just, okay. uh, well, thank you, um, and thank you for inviting us along today. I, I just thought it might be helpful for the committee just to um, set a little bit of context for the Asher Grove deal. Um, the Asher Grove deal uh, is not formally agreed yet. Um, it, it's um, there's a commitment from the Scottish government, but we are still pursuing commitment, formal commitment from the UK government. Um, the Grove deal is an all but name a city deal. We view it as the same type of mechanism. So we expect it to have funding from the Scottish Government, from the UK Government, and indeed from the local partners. Um, so in that sense, it's exactly the same in, in our mind as a city deal and over the same kind of period of time is, is, is our ambition. Um, as I say, we're making good progress with the Scottish Government. Um, we've had quite a lot of engagement with UK Government officials but we really need um, a green light from the Treasury, and we hope to get that in the upcoming budget on the 22nd of November, which will allow us to go into formal discussions with the UK government. Uh, within Scotland, we've got cross-party support, and we're very sort of grateful for all the political parties who are um, working on our behalf and, and pressing hard to secure that, uh, that commitment from the UK government. We think... There's a compelling case for Ayrshire. Um, there's a compelling case in terms of need, um, the underperformance of the Ayrshire economy. We think there's a compelling case in terms of the opportunity. Some of the key sectors that we have are important, not just for Ayrshire, but also for uh, Scotland and the UK as a whole. And we're placing inclusive growth at the heart of what we're trying to achieve. And we think there's also, uh, I, I suppose equity may not be quite the right word, but most of Scotland is now covered one way or another by city deals and we feel Ayrshire is an important part of the Scottish economy and as such we should be doing all we can to secure the investment to help it realise its potential. Thank you very much Mr Wiggins. Uh, Mr Duff do you want to add? Happy to. Um, I represent Falkirk Council in, in these uh, discussions and uh, probably to give an update on the submission that we gave back at the time of the consultation things have been uh, moving forward in Falkirk, uh, we propose an investment zone. It's part of the uh, propositions within the National Planning Framework 3 document, and we've been uh, making progress on, on that uh, proposal with Scottish Government, uh, with UK Government, and uh, a number of stakeholders in, in that process. Um, at the time of the consultation, we were uh, reaching agreement with Scottish Government to proceed on a business case, and that work has been taking place over the period of, of summer and autumn this, this year. Um, there's been a number of workshops taking place involving business and various stakeholders in, in the area to bring that forward. We've had a conference of business last week just to convey uh, where, where the, the stage that that work has reached. And we believe that uh, we're in a good place now to help to carry that forward. The Investment Zone builds on our work on tax increment financing and uh, acknowledges our need for infrastructure improvements, but also improvements to help deal with the, the concerns of the community um, and uh, the prospects for development of the particular the chemical sector in, in, in Grangemouth. Grangemouth is a, a, a tipping point currently. There is major investment in, in prospect at that location, and we see this as, as a vital step not solely for the, the, the local economy, but for the national economy. Uh, we, our, our work on this started back in 2013 at the time of, of a 
crisis situation uh, affected by the prospect of lo losing the INEOS operations at the site. We're now moving that forward and we see the investment zone as, as key to taking that, uh, that, that work forward. Um, so really, we see this as having moved things forward considerably and are looking forward to further discussions with Scottish and UK government to enable that to take place. Enough, and it's been indicated that Mr Forder thinks making open remarks on behalf of SDS. Thank you. I'd just like to give a very brief overview of SDS's um, approach to, to skills planning and support for the city region deals for context. Um, at the heart of everything we do at SDS, we have our, our skills planning model, which looks at supporting the needs of employers and providing individuals with information to help them make informed and sustained and good career choices. And one of the things we've been heavily involved in in recent years is developing robust labour market information or regional skills assessments. And that's on a local authority basis, a college outcome agreement basis and a city region basis where that exists. And that information is then used uh, to help support um, city region deal partners develop their propositions. We've also used them to develop sectoral skills investment plans across 11 key uh, sectors of the economy and to develop regional skills investment plans uh, in a number of regions across uh, Scotland, again, uh, with the support of city uh, region deal partners. And we've produced um, in the last couple of weeks our Jobs and Skills in Scotland report, which provides labour market intelligence um, across Scotland in terms of supply and demand and some of the key challenges faced in the labour market and, and well worth um, a read. But more specifically, in terms of how we support and have supported the city region deals, growth deals, etc. across Scotland, the labour market information we provide provides some strategic insight to help partners make the decisions about where they might want to go with the projects and also to stress test some of the assumptions behind the projects which are being developed. Um, we also support the framing of inclusive growth and skills within the regional skills investment plans and the um, sectoral skills investment plans. Um, and the information that we um, provide will also help uh, make decisions about um, where to prioritise effort and support as we expand our work-based learning uh, offer in terms of foundation apprenticeships, graduate level apprenticeships and of course the modern apprenticeship programme and to target those SDS products and services to specifically address um, areas of labour market underperformance. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, Thank you everyone for those opening statements and obviously we'll pick off different themes that were raised during those open remarks as we go through roughly an hour for our evidence session. And we'll move to questions now. Andy Whiteman, MSP. Yeah, thanks very much for uh, Thanks for coming in today and thanks for your written evidence uh, some time ago, I think, so obviously there may, things may have changed a wee bit. Um, I mean, we look at these city region deals and obviously Ayrshire and, and uh, Falkirk don't have a city region deal as such or talking about them. Um, I'm just wondering, given that uh, in Falkirk's case you talked about uh, an investment zone and aligning it with the national planning framework, um, is this a bit of a kind of a messy policy environment where you've got city deals which were introduced in some some something of, of haste, really, in, in 2014, focused on cities as growth areas for regions. You've got national planning framework, we've got no regional policy, and we've got agendas around community empowerment. I mean, in a sense, are you just uh, following the trend? Do you want some of the action? Um, or do you think there needs to be a more coherent approach to how we do regional policy out with the big cities? Mr Duff. Happy to cover that. And, and our, our submission does, does make that point, that uh, at the time of making the submission, the Enterprise and Skills Review was taking place and has been looking at this area of the, the coordination of, of uh, the various uh, area targeted initiatives that take place across the country and uh, I think we, we do see a, a need for more consistency and, and clarity on, on the models that, that uh, should be taken forward and you know so I think I think it's plain in the spice briefing we are the the hole in the in the middle in, in terms of coverage of city deals and and uh, the the pattern of activities that are taking place, um, but uh, in our terms, um, Grangemouth is critical to the nation's economy, and that was seen in, in 2013, and is going through a major change. And it's important at this point in time that we're clear about how that's taken forward. Um, our approach in terms of initiatives has been to position ourselves clearly in regard to the national policy picture. And I think we do have quite strong alignment there. Um, at the, after the INEOS situation in 2013, our economic partnership came together. It defined a new economic strategy 
for the area. That economic strategy is, I think, well aligned <coughs> to the, the national economic strategy. It has the similar priorities and it does point towards the tools that are necessary to deliver on the changes that that strategy looks to, to achieve. I think we do recognise that, you know, certainly for us, we don't quite fit the picture with, with city regions, but we are always open to engaging with partners around us, you know, so on a variety of measures, we do engage with the various authorities around about us, and we participate actively in national uh, forums to, to take forward the, the prospects for the economy. But I, th I think from our perspective, the tools are there. There are a range of tools that are, are available to us for, for economic development to be carried forward. It's the structure in which those tools are applied that needs more clarity. And I, th I think part of that can come through the enterprise review, the emergence of regional partnerships perhaps will help enable that to take place, but perhaps more in-depth structuring of the approaches that take place and which recognise the contribution that each area, each community can, can, can make towards the national economic growth is an important uh, uh, factor to consider. Yeah, I, I think um, from our point of view, um, I think the Enterprise and Skills Review has set out a sort of a path for economic growth and economic development um, across Scotland. And Ayrshire was identified as a pathfinder region in that. So. In terms of our work on the growth deal, um, we very much see the Pathfinder work sitting alongside that. Um, the growth deal would only deliver certain aspects of what we think is necessary to make Ayrshire a, a successful economy. And how we deliver economic development services and how we do that in a way which is joined up with our partners is absolutely critical. So we're working, as I say, alongside the growth deal with a to develop a governance model which will bring in our partners and bring in crucially the private sector to actually set an overview and a strategy for the Esher economy going forward but also being very clear about the types of services that we need to put in place um, to deliver that economic growth and by economic growth I do mean inclusive growth and we're very clear that that has to be at the core of what we're doing and what we've tried to, to do is marry up our economic ambitions with something called the Inclusive Growth Diagnostic, which was developed by the Scottish Government and had a pilot in North Ayrshire. We've now rolled that out across all of the Ayrshires. And we're using the evidence from that diagnostic to inform how we take forward this new shared delivery vehicle for economic growth in Ayrshire. Do you want to follow up on some of that, Mr. Whiteman? Yeah, so, uh, that's, that's very useful. Um, I mean, in, in, um, in your evidence, uh, Mr. Wiggins, you, you say that uh, city region slash growth deals should be matched by comprehensive monitoring and evaluation frameworks. Deals involve an element of risk for local authorities. Many comprise of payment by results mechanisms. Um, that's in relation to conventional city region deals. Um, I mean, is that critique overcome by some of the thinking that's going on in Ayrshire at the moment? I, I think it's too early to say in Ayrshire because we've not got to that point of negotiations with government. I think we don't, don't want payment by results model. Or no, I, 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 I think we're open to those discussions. It, it, the question for us is how can we secure the funding we think is necessary to improve the infrastructure in the area? And... Of course, if, if, if grant funding were fully available, then that would be our preferred option. But equally, we recognise that public finances are tight um, and there's going to be an element of risk in this and that risk has to be shared across all parties. And therefore, when we're in discussions with either the Scottish Government or indeed the UK Government, we're open to all forms of investment. And, and in fact, you know, uh, Douglas mentioned that the the TIF, and, and that's a similar payment by results type process. Um, and so is um, growth accelerator models, which have been used elsewhere in Scotland. And I think all we're saying is that we're open to those kinds of uh, discussions to try and secure the best possible result for, for Ayrshire. And can I ask a question about the governance framework? Um, so I'm focusing on the city region deals rather than skills in this line of questioning. Um, how do you ensure the uh, good governance, in particular the participation um, and engagement of communities in all of this. I mean, there's a big community impairment agenda, and yet city deals or growth deals by their very nature 
you know, implicit in the name is a, is a deal-making process between executive authorities, local authorities and two governments. Um, and there's a risk that the conventional democratic engagement that takes place in local authorities on a day-to-day -day basis around planning, for example, um, gets missed in, in, in these. Can you say something about how you envisage, um, you know, how engaged communities are, your, 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 your residents in these deals? I think, um, I think f from our point of view, that's something which will come through the new governance framework we want to put in place for the Pathfinder. Um, so we have an interim governance arrangement at the moment, which is sort of seeing us through the deal negotiation phase, um, and that's comprises of three local authorities and, and senior members from each of the, um, each of the three authorities. Um, we are in the process of designing the new governance model, but we're quite clear that it needs to include a whole range of our partners, including the third sector and, and community representation, so that we have this overview of everyone who can play a part and participate in um, the growth and the prosperity of Ayrshire. And the growth deal will just be part of that. Um, it's, it's, the growth deal is a set of projects, but actually what what all the local authorities and partners are doing is a much broader set of initiatives, which include skills, in, um, employability, it could include planning, it could in, in, involve uh, regulatory services. There's a whole range of levers we can pull um, to, to actually try and improve the, the working of the local economy. And as such, we want the Pathfinder to be able to embrace all of that and to be able to articulate the relationship between the growth deal projects and the whole range of services that we need to deliver that economic growth and that inclusive growth. And that will include um, how we work with our communities. Uh, our governance structure is probably simpler because we're not engaging other authorities in, in our process. So the investment zone proposition that we're working on currently focuses on, on our council area um, and embeds itself with the, the range of other activities that take place through our community planning partnership. And so the community planning partnership brings together all the uh, public sector and third sector bodies uh, in the area to advance the uh, overall ambitions for the community. And there is quite extensive involvement of the community in, in that uh, structure. Um, our input to that is uh, through an economic partnership, which is the lead body for ad advancing the economic activities of, of the community plan and that does engage business in, in its work so they, that brings the business component to it and acknowledges a breadth of, of uh, various activities taking place in relation to the development of the economy and carrying forward the economic strategy. The economic strategy has three pillars to it, it's about growth, investment and inclusion and in, in terms of inclusion there is quite extensive uh, activities and networks in place to, to um, move that forward in terms of particularly employability, uh, but in relation to the likes of supported business and employment and in community engagement and regeneration activities. So we have quite a, a clear um, governance structure that allows us to take that forward and there is scope at, at, in each stage for, for community involvement. Um, in terms of input to the investment zone proposition itself, as Patrick's saying again, we're, that will encompass a range of, of projects. And I think it, it will be important, first of all, to have sight of the, the prospect of this being carried forward. I think it's important in engaging the community to involve them at a point when there is something clear to discuss. And at, at a stage when this is a bit uncertain as, as to what can come forward that can introduce confusion and it's important to avoid that. So just now at the stage we're at, we're trying to flesh out the package and that will be the basis for further engagement with the community when it's ready. Okay. Now, in a moment, I'm going to bring Mr Gibson in because he's got a strong constituency interest, so uh, he'll, he'll want to explore a, a line of question. But just clarify something with community engagement. I think with a similar line of questioning by Jenny Gogos last week, uh, in relation to projects that may or may not be considered uh, as part of a city-region deal or the various uh, deals that are being proposed here. Uh, and that is, at what point uh, those that are crafting what a deal might look like goes to a community 
or community organisations and says, there's various options here, we're talking about inclusive growth, there's only so much money on the table, what would communities' priorities be and engage with them at a co-production stage rather than presenting communities with a fait accompli as to see, here's what we are doing for growth or inclusive growth, now you can tweak at the fringes some of this, I think, and Ms Gorif may want to explore that again this week. Um, there was issues around uh, community buy-in at the various early stages, so any co examples of co-production? And then we'll take Mr Gibson in specifically on their Shire stuff. Yes, but, but perhaps um, maybe not quite as far as co-production, but certainly we've used um, a number of standard um, community events um, across the airships where they have community conferences to talk about the deal um, and talk and listen to uh, community groups and community representatives about some of the issues they face and some of the concerns they have. And we've looked at that in the context of developing some of our programs. Uh, I think the other thing I would say is that the deal is only part of the picture, you know, and what we have to see is that the deal projects fit within this broader, um, I suppose, pattern or network of projects on services which are delivered by all of the partners in the local area. So it is part of the issue. It's not the entire solution. That's helpful. And no one else seems to have done the other way about that we are suggesting either. I should point out Mr Wiggins, so we're not singling out the, no, the, the no, witnesses here, no, no. so don't worry about that. Mr Duff, just wondering any examples? I would mention our work in community planning, that that's the principal model by which communities are engaged in, in, their, in defining the ambitions for, for the community and how they should be delivered. And, you know, through, th through that, we've done consultation on the plan itself. We acknowledge one of the priorities in the plan, you know, there's a clear in commitment to inclusion and amongst the priorities is the need to reduce youth un unemployment. That brings a range of existing activities and that's the point when we can look towards the prospects of new money coming at, being introduced. I, th I think as Patrick's saying, it's not just about the growth deal. We've, we operate a range of inclusion programmes. Um, we've bid successfully recently for the Fair Start uh, programme in, in the Fourth Valley. So that's an opportunity there for particularly the third sector and others to shape how that would be delivered. So th I think we would use those mechanisms and, and it's a discussion more about that being a community priority and how that can be met and then how the service is shaped to meet it. And that's helpful. Community planning partnerships help focus yeah. where the community priorities sit. Yeah. So that, that, that becomes helpful to the committee. Yeah. Mr Gibson, there were some matters we want. We will get to Skills Development Scotland shortly, I do promise you. Well, I mean, one Mr. of my Gibson questions is going to be for Skills Development Scotland as well, actually based on what Mr Ford had said in the previous answer. But I was just going to ask a, a, a convener, um, uh, just on the uh, back of the questions that uh, Andy Whiteman had asked, uh, 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 Patrick Wiggins in page two of his submission said, and I quote, given the need to ensure inclusive growth, all city region growth deals should illustrate how they achieve the same. And he talked in his response about the inclusive growth diagnostic. I'm just wondering if you can tell us a wee bit more about what that actually is uh, and uh, how that will impact positively in terms of delivering for the most economically challenged parts of Ayrshire, such as, for example, the Garnock Valley. Okay. Um <laughs> The inclusive growth diagnostic uh, is a tool be, which has been delivered, sorry, developed by the Scottish Government. Um, and it's a tool which basically does um, an intensive analysis of the statistics and indeed speaking to um, a, a number of individuals and stakeholders in, in a local area. And it identifies um, the key barriers to economic activity. So, and that can be a range of things from economic barriers through to social barriers, through to infrastructure barriers, through to, so it, it covers everything from skills, healthcare, um, childcare, child provision, through to local transport issues, through to jobs, local jobs, skills. It, 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 it ranks a whole series of barriers based upon the evidence of a local area. Um, in terms of what's stopping them or what's hindering them uh, getting access to um, employment opportunities. So for Ayrshire, there's 18 barriers have been identified. So what we're looking at is looking at those 18 barriers, um, 
we're looking at the strategic priorities for Asia as a whole, uh, and, and as Douglas has said, in, you know, it, it covers things like economic opportunity as well as issues to do with skills and how we achieve inclusion. And then we match the two together, and that's forming the structure that we want to develop for delivering the Pathfinder. So the types of services that informs will become the basis of the Pathfinder and the services that that will deliver to local communities. So we hope by reshaping our, pro our services and by bringing in new infrastructure funding, then we will be able to tackle some of those ish areas which have really deep-seated long-term deprivation problems by having a fresh look and a fresh focus and prioritization of service activities to try and hit upon the key problems that those particular communities have. What, what are these service activities? Because I get, you previously also mentioned that uh, you need to look at the types of services you need to put in place. So say a place like Coburnie, what would be the services that would go in something well, like that? Um, the, the, again, the, you would expect the normal business development services. Um, you'd expect um, to bring in um, as, as much closer alignment with um, skills in terms of some of the work we're doing with Skills Development Scotland in terms of developing the Pathfinder and the growth deal. We'd want to be able to make sure that we can link more closely to our community development colleagues to make sure that they're focusing on some of the key barriers to the economy that have been identified through the diagnostic and they're heavily involved in the work. Um, and we also need to look at some of the infrastructure issues um, which could do with transport, local access to transport to help people get into um, local employment opportunities and also to look at some of the digital constraints that people have in some of those communities in terms of access to infrastructure and access to skills. So it's a whole range of different services which currently at the moment are sort of dotted around um, but it's really about pulling them together and giving them a real strategic Im Im impetus. I mean, you know, last year I looked to try and move my constituency office um, just an office for three, four people in the Garnet Valley, yeah. which is, you know, is an area of about 20,000 yeah. people. Do you know, there wasn't one single place in the whole Garnet Valley where there was an office available. Yes, not because not because there weren't many vacant premises or loads, but there was no actual facilities, there's no physical structures yes. for a business yes. to move into. So if I was wanting to set up a business and I'd decide to move from Renfrewshire or Glasgow to, Air, to the Garnet Valley, there's actually nowhere physically to move, regardless mm. of any services you may wish to provide in terms of skills or what have you. I mean, th 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 even that basic element is not on the ground. Mm. So how, how, how would the, the growth deals deal with something like that? Um, and I'm just wondering if Mr Ford can comment as well about the about because you were talking about market failures is, is physical structure such as is not yes. a, a key to unlocking that yes uh, uh, for other committee yes. members following uh, this inquiry could you give an example of the type of infrastructure that's missing that stopped you relocating because it'd be interesting to the committee to know that's been identified mm. within the, 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 the deal yeah. well for example one of the things that, uh, Mr Wiggins talked about was digital connectivity and I think that's really important but you've got to have an office in which to work from really I mean, I mean as I was saying we, we just got a simple parliamentary office we thought we need to move because the rent was too high we actually negotiated a 40% reduction in rent in the end but there was nowhere we could have moved to we physically could not move anywhere else in the Garnet Valley because there is not such there are no office uh, office type facilities available so if you're wanting to set up a business one two three people uh, in somewhere like that you actually cannot do it so whether you've got the skills or not there is not a physical location and i think part of the deal surely is not just about upskilling people uh, and bring if you're going to actually bring in the private sector which is part of the of the the deal's ambition you really have to have somewhere where people can actually physically go yeah. in these towns you know to operate a business from um, uh, <coughs> low, low, low commercial property yes. prices, but yeah. no a actually yeah, ready-made office space for companies to uh, move into. Uh, Is that something that's been identified? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I couldn't agree 100% more in terms of the, the this chronic um, market failure in Asia in a commercial property sense. So um, the values of commercial property just don't stack up in terms of um, uh, the cost of, of build. You know, um, so. You know, some of the work we did um, previously in, with Irving Bay, um, the value of some of the properties you create is only about one third of the cost of, of developing them. So it's a huge market failure, you know. And, um, you know, a key component of, of our particular growth deal proposals is actually speculative build of new business premises um, because we recognise that there is this chronic market failure. And yes, we need to get the skills, we need to get the infrastructure in place. But actually, we do need physical 
places where people can work. Um, and they need to be modern and they need to be of a good quality if we're going to attract the type of business that we need to attract to create the value in the economy which is going to raise living standards. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, Mr. Gibson, I'm cautiously going to let you back in for one more question because yeah, the inquiry sure. is not into Ayrshire. I know, it's more I know. general, but the, well, this is this is this is a kind of Ayrshire, but also could be a more general question, which is Glasgow City deal uh, has been running since 2014. We've already heard that there are still it still needs to be some buy-in from the UK government in terms of the Ayrshire growth deal. Um, so there's no dates as to when that's likely to even commence or it'll successfully conclude. So I'm just wondering what impact that's likely to have on Ayrshire. If other areas are getting up and running, we went to Glasgow Airport last week and we had about three uh, projects in that neck of the woods that's going to uh, mm -hmm. have 275 million investment. Now, the hint last week was, or what they said in response to the question for me, was that this might create a ripple effect which might benefit Ayrshire. My concern is an actual fact that it will suck skilled workers yeah. out of Ayrshire and it might actually cause yeah. considerable displacement activity. So I'm just wondering what the view of the panel is, uh, because obviously Falkirk is also in a similar position uh, with Edinburgh's growth deal. Do you Are you concerned that delays in growth deal will in fact adversely impact on the ability of Ayrshire to compete relative to areas that have growth deals? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think obviously in Glasgow's case, it's too early to say there's a concrete evidence of that um, because it, they're still in the early stages of their development. But yes, there has to be a concern that, um, you know, Ayrshire is, is a secondary or tertiary market in, in, in commercial terms. And the more investment which happens in the centre of Glasgow or close to the centre of Glasgow is likely to suck up demand in the Scottish economy. And that will make it even harder for areas like Ayrshire to achieve its potential. Uh, and, and that's one of our concerns. Um, we believe that with the right investment, we can achieve that potential. But there is a concern of, you know, there's a timing issue in all this. And we don't really want Ayrshire to be left behind. There's, there's a bit of an expression um, that whenever there's a recession, Ayrshire or somewhere like Ayrshire tends to be first in and it tends to be last out. Um, and, you know, that means that you're, you're constantly behind the curve. And what we want to try and do is, is get to the point where we're, I suppose we're, we're competing on an equal footing. Mr Duff, is there similar concerns around Falkirk that if you don't get on the game quickly and progress some of this, then you, you, you may see a displacement effect from, from your region? I, I think there, there is a concern. We ha have a concern in relation to our, our current commitments with TIF. Um, so as Patrick's saying, you know, the, the TIF model is a risk-based model. It is about the council borrowing from Public Works Loan Board uh, to provide infrastructure. That infrastructure stimulates development in property provision. The rates, the non-domestic rates uplift from that property comes back to the council and repays the borrowing. So if the development doesn't come, then we don't get the money to repay the debt. Um, and there's different gateways and so on. You know, there, there's review mechanisms that, that allow us to make sure um, that that's on track, and currently it is. But when we entered into it, there was not the prospect of all these city deals taking place around the country. So we took cognizance of what was around us at the time, and we're expecting that we could achieve a level of, of growth seeing what was, what, what was around us. That position has changed, and there will be an expectation of, of development taking place around us that we have to have a, an eye to with, with the TIF. But what we are looking towards is that we've got a USP. We've got, sorry, we've got two USPs. <laughs> One is our, our prospect in chemicals and, and what that can come forward. The other is in relation to tourism, and we've seen pretty massive expansion in tourism arising from the Kelpies. Yeah. Maybe it's three because it's two horses. Um, but uh, but um, basically what we're looking at is that the, the city deals you know, and the TIFs and the growth accelerators and so on, in some are about Scotland seeing you know, its prospect for economic growth across the board and making the most of each area's unique contribution that it can do. So the prospects that we see, in particularly in the chemical sector around Grangemouth, can only happen in Grangemouth because of the kit that is there and the prospect of feedstocks and so on, the, the cluster that, that, that exists there. 
And Ayrshire exhibits that as well. It's got strengths in, in its chemical sector and in, it, in the aeronautics sector and so on. And, and I think part of our plea is let's acknowledge that. Let's acknowledge the diversity of um, the profile across Scotland and play to its strengths. Look towards seeing what can come forward in each locality around the country and that deals, if they are to be structured, should play to those strengths. And you know that that's been the argument we took in, in establishing the TIF initially. We have got concerns about the TIF as being such a, a dedicated tool. It has got those risks. It's not sufficiently flexible in how it is applied. And so we're looking at this investment zone to give us that more flexibility that we see will give us added growth. And really, that's the plea that we were making in our submission that. We need greater clarity to enable that kind of thing to be realised. Uh, just for Mr Wiggins, uh, apologies, we really need to, yes. to, to move on. Um, the, the, I know all the MSPs around this table know that you, table know that USP is unique selling point, Mr Whiteman, don't they? So uh, just to, to cla cla <laughs> clarify that. But I'm going to move to Mr Simpson in a second. Where the question was around the, the pacing of various city region deals, displacement, drawing monies and investment from one part of the country or another, potentially. Is there a skills element to that as well? Are SDS aware of any displacement in the, the skills sector in relation to the different pacing of different deals? So much displacement. I think one of the things that um, Phil mentioned in the introduction is around the uh, granular detail of the labour market information now. So we can um, really build upon the comments that were made there about uh, where there is regional priorities. Uh, and use an example between Edinburgh and Glasgow, both are very big for financial and business services, but they're not necessarily in direct competition with each other because they focus on different elements of that. So uh, the West side might concentrate more on, on uh, insurance uh, and, and, and aspects relating to, to uh, life and wealth management and, and retail banking and uh, et cetera on, on the East. So I think what you can do is actually look at where the regional strengths play to the advantage of Scotland as a whole uh, and really capitalise around where those strengths lie. And you're calling the SDS is monitoring each of these city region deals or growth deals to make sure SDS is well placed to support any skills gap that might emerge? So one of the things that was suggested there uh, in, in the introduction was the building of, of, of new products. The, the, the regional skills assessments are already well established as annual publications that are bought into by ourselves, the enterprise agencies, the funding council and local authorities, which provide a, a, a picture on a, a local authority by local authority basis. What we've also introduced is annual reports that report on city region deal uh, geographies and are able to monitor that on an ongoing basis too. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, we'll move on to our next line of questioning. Graham Simpson. Thanks. Um, uh, I just want to uh, explore the sort of in inclusivity um, element of your, your proposals. Um, uh, Mr Wiggins, in your submission, you uh, say that inclusive growth runs right through our proposals. Um, we don't actually give any examples, so I wonder if you could do that. Um, and also, um, for really for all of you, um, are any of these deals, are, there, are any of the I ideas, proposals in them, do they, any of them actually come from the community? Do they come from businesses? Or are they top-down? Because the evidence we've heard so far, um, certainly from the previous panel, is that it, it is very top-down, uh, and you might engage with the community some way down the line, but you're not asking for ideas um, from, from people or businesses. OK, Mr Wiggins, you were mentioned during that, that question. Okay. Should really take um, Yes, I, I think in terms of inclusive growth, um, again, there's, there's a number of ways we've, we've tried to tackle this. Um, I've mentioned the Pathfinder, and, and we need to see this within the context of the Pathfinder and the services that it's going to deliver, and the fact that at the core of that, we're looking at the barriers to inclusive growth and making sure that the, the span of services and, and offer that it has will be able to address those barriers. Second thing is that um, within all, there's 18 projects at the moment in the Asia Growth Deal, and um, all of those projects, when they've been developed, um, the questions being asked of them, 
um, how can they begin to tackle um, some of the issues in terms of access to employment, inclusivity, um, and to make sure that um, they are projects which are de developed in a way that addresses some of the barriers that we have to inclusive growth. And then within those 18 projects, we have a set of projects which are um, primarily looking at um, employability type services. So how can we um, work alongside the employability initiatives that are already there, but actually hone them and make them much more specific and actually target some of the harder to reach communities. So we have a project, for example, um, working for a healthy economy, which is looking at those people who are struggling to access employment at the moment because of health issues or indeed to maintain employment because of health issues, working with uh, the NHS to put together um, a bespoke set of um, services to help them either sustain employment or get to that first point of, of entering the labour market. Uh, we're also looking at something called co-hubs, which is sort of community-based hubs, which uh, again will have a physical representation in the communities, um, which we think will open up access to services, access to support, access to um, employment um, opportunities, and access to um, community development and outreach. Um, so again, they're a critical part of what we're proposing to do. So there's a mix, there's almost like a, a matrix, there's the individual projects. We're asking them to identify how they can link into inclusive growth opportunities. So whether that's the spaceport or indeed one of the community projects, we have got community projects themselves, and then we've got the whole sort of structure which we're putting around that in terms of delivery, which is the, the Pathfinder. So we're hoping with those different levels we are um, tackling or going to tackle head on um, the issue of inclusive growth and the barriers to economic activity. Um, in terms of inclusivity, um, we, we certainly have involved the business community in the, um, in the development of our projects. We've had uh, workshops, we've had briefing sessions, and indeed the, the private sector is uh, involved in the, directly in a number of the projects and the development of those projects. Um, and as I said previously, um, we've had some engagement with um, community organisations, primarily through the community development teams of um, the three local authorities and some of the events that they're holding. Um, and we go along and we, we speak to those community groups and representations about the deal and what we're proposing to do and to take some feedback from them so we can play that back into the evolving deal proposals. Um, briefly, probably to come back to the point I made about community planning earlier, that, that uh, our work aligns with the community plan and that has a, a very strong um, component of community engagement that has shaped the community plan and shaped its priorities. And you know, one of the key messages that came back in the early days of putting the community plan together was the concern about jobs, you know, that, that people want to see jobs, particularly youth unemployment. Youth unemployment is one of the uh, priorities in our outcomes agreement. And uh, that has, as a consequence, meant that programmes have been designed to uh, align with that activity and, and tackle uh, youth unemployment where, where we can and increasingly focus on those who are most disadvantaged in, in, in the labour market. And we've done quite extensive research to, to look at how we can target that and build a national best practice to, to achieve it. Um, so the community <coughs> plans are an important uh, a component to that. I, I think the other component for, for us in terms of the latest work on an investment zone, and I'd say the investment zone is, is something that tries to capture our prospects for a city deal. It's our equivalent of that, but it is about looking at the next phase of investment in uh, prospects for our economy and for the community. That has to, to uh, be, be, be vital to it. And I would point to the situation back on 20, the day in 2013 when the NEOS announcement was, was made. Um, immediately you had TV crews running down into Grangemouth Town Centre speaking to the people in the community about what the prospect was for, for that community. And their key concern was jobs. And the whole point then about this exercise, about our economic strategy that was put together was to enable us to secure jobs, to diversify the area's economy so that we had strength within it, that we don't have that kind of shock occurring again in the future. 
and make sure that people in the community can access th those jobs. What we, what we are doing is introducing the diagnostic tool uh, to look at how our, our inclusion services work, align those with our community planning partners, so SDS are actively involved in this, but the health service and the third sector are active players in those inclusion uh, packages, and they will be an, a, a key underpinning to the work on the investment zone. Yeah, um, I, just, I want to ask you a bit about that in investment zone. Um, obviously, Falkirk is, is not part of a city deal. Uh, and it's quite a small council. Um, but you're right that Grangemouth is, Grangemouth is important to the national economy. And when you think about Grangemouth, all you think about is the chemical plant. Um, so perhaps you can tell us a bit more about the proposals for Grangemouth. I presume it in involves more than the chemical plant. Um, uh, basically, uh, Grangemouth is, as I say, important to the national economy. The NOS plant itself supports estimated around 10,000 jobs as, across Scotland. Um, every chemicals job supports about seven jobs elsewhere, you know, so it's important in, in itself in that sense. Probably uh, it's supporting around 4% of, of GDP across the country. Um, what I would highlight is that Grangemouth Port is also significant. It's got a symbiotic relationship with the, the chemicals operations down there. Um, but it's Scotland's largest port and, and it's significant in terms of the container traffic that goes through the, through the port, carrying about third, a third, again, of, of Scotland's uh, exports going through the port. So, you know, an important uh, tool for, for the na nation's economy. And the investment zone work looks to build on this. You know, so it is about seeing the forward prospect for the port and for the chemicals complex. Uh, any of us are investing significant sums currently. So they've just completed the spend of probably about half a billion pounds in the importation of, of new ethane feedstocks uh, to the site. That has doubled the productivity of their cracker, the cr cracker that produces the plastics that feed other manufacturers around the country. They have got plans for further investment at that site. Um, and so th they're looking to carry those forward. But there are other important chemicals operators down at Grangemouth. So there's companies like Calichem, like Syngenta, like Fujifilm, who are active players in, in the area's economy. And it does work as, as a cluster, as a sector, and there's good practice in there that we would want to see fostered through, through the work on, on the zone. We've called it an investment zone just to be sufficiently flexible to take account of the variety of measures that can come forward here to galvanise support from the business community, from the local community and from the public sector to help to carry that forward. But we do see you know, significant further investment in prospect um, and the, the business case that we're working on uh, does anticipate that. Investment in new energy kit, you know, so the, the current energy plant there is ageing and needs replaced and there's a number of of prospects there that, that are being looked to, to come forward. Right in the midst of it, you've got communities where 40% of people are in fuel poverty. So we're looking at how, in investing in energy, we can enable the community to benefit. And we've looked extensively at district heating networks and so on as a way of carrying that forward. So these are you know, amongst the thinking, you know, the plans that we're making with the investment zone. But fundamentally, we see that as seeing another significant stage in Grangemouth development and in its prospects to contribute to the nation's economy. That's, that, that, that's, that's really interesting, actually. And, and you, you say in your submission that there's an overemphasis on the role of cities. Uh, and as I said earlier, Falkirk, small council, um, but Grangemouth so, so important, as, as, as you've expressed. Do you feel that Falkirk would, would benefit by being part of a, a city deal, which you, you could, you're currently not, you're out on your own? Um, do, do, you know, do, do you think you'd benefit by being part of something bigger? 
I, I think we play into those things anyway. You know, we're uh, we're an open economy. We've got you know a lot of in and out com uh, commuting takes place day, day in day out. Our relationship is with the whole of Scotland. You know, particularly in the central belt. And and for us, this is about all boats rising together. It's about trying to make sure that all of the benefits of whatever initiative comes forward, west or east, you know, benefits the whole of the central belt and of, of the nation's economy and play to our strengths. You know, so so we've we've really been looking to make sure that you know, with the opportunity is is really at this point in time with what is coming forward at Grangemouth and to make the most of that that will enable Scotland's overall economy to grow. So I, I don't think we're, you know, our suggestion in the, in the submission was a need for more consistency of approach and clarity on, on how this, this should come forward. I don't think we're bound and, and would want to be bound by any particular structure around city deals and, and, and so on aligned to any particular city. We see ourselves as, as being playing a, a national role, and that is Im important to make sure that at this point in time, that opportunity is seized. Okay, that's fine. Uh, before before we move to Jenny Goldruth, can I just mop up a line of questioning? Because I'm conscious there's an overlap to SDS and some of these questions. The underlying question there was in really relation to how some projects are identified and selected, and the role of the business community or the, the wider local communities and around inclusive growth. So at what point would Skills Development Scotland get involved in those conversations? In particular, I was thinking about there could be two or three different competing projects, but consideration might be given to which projects, the type of work that will be created, the nature of that work, the skills level of that work, the long-term long -term nature of that work, but also the readiness of the local labour market to access it. Because 100 jobs created around the Falkirk area or in Ayrshire, could be a hundred people who are skills ready moving to the Ayrshire area or the Falkirk here, which is good for inward migration, but it squeezes out the local labour market that wants to be upskilled. So at what point would Skills Development Scotland be involved in those discussions? Would you ever get involved in discussions ahead of projects being selected to make sure the local labour market is skills ready or a bit of input into what projects, there are competing projects out there, what project might be best for the local labour market? Mr. Ford. Yeah, I think we've we've come in at the city region deals and growth deals at different stages. So at some points we've become involved when the deals have been signed or uh, when it's sort of further down the track. But at that point we'd we'd still be able to help shape and refine perhaps some of the proposals. Um, so we would bring the labour market information to bear. We would look at the sector where there's going to be opportunities. We'd look at where there would be opportunities for local people. Uh, and then we would look um, through the support we give to, to young people in school to provide information about those opportunities as they consider career options. Um, and other uh, city deals like the Tay Cities deal, uh, we were involved pretty much right from the start and we had an opportunity to, to shape some of the thinking around that and test some of the assumptions. And effectively the projects went through a filter, so there was a wide range of projects and there was a process of narrowing those projects down into what um, turned into the submission to, to government. So we were able to bring together the information that we have in terms of the labour market and the opportunities to help them select which were going to have the, the greatest impact across that particular region. I apologise for asking a brief follow-up question, it's almost as if I'm putting words in your mouth, Mr Ford or Mr Zealy, but does it become self-evident that the earlier that Skills Development Scotland is involved in those discussions, because we're learning as this process works through across the country, the better it would be for uh, inclusive growth and maximising the benefit to local labour markets? I think it certainly helps. I mean, the regional skills assessments have, uh, have been around for a few years now. We're, we're refining and updating those all the time, and the local authorities and economic development partners within the local authorities are, are using that. But as we've started to develop and, and strengthen the relationships with the partners, and we've entered into quite open and um, frank discussions about how that what that data is saying and what can be done about it, it's taken us to a very positive place in terms of how we actually move forward with them to, to agree a set of priorities which are really going to make a difference within within a region. Okay, that's very helpful. Jenny Goldruth. Convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I want to drill down a bit in terms of SDS's involvement in the, the city deals and particularly with regard to the Edinburgh deal. Mr Ford, I appreciate you said that you come in at different points dependent on, on different deals. But as you'll know, the Edinburgh city deal includes investment of up to £25 million over eight years for integrated regional employability and skills programme. 
And within the heads and terms, it states that this will reduce skill shortages and gaps and deliver incremental support wide improvements to boost the flow of individuals from disadvantaged groups such as care leavers or the unemployed. Um, in the SDS written submission, though, um, it highlights work in Midlothian and West Lothian and Borders. I, I don't see any reference specifically to Fife. I wonder if you might be able to give some Fife examples. Yep, so we work with all the local authority partners across the city region deal and within that suite of integrated regional employability and skills projects, there, there are projects that each of the local authorities um, will, will have a particular focus and, and lead on. So Fife has been involved in uh, the projects around uh, developing the young workforce. They sit uh, with us on the skills and innovation working group. So as we've developed um, the regional skills investment plan, as we've supported partners to take forward the, the proposals, um, we've been able to work closely with all the local authorities and linking in with, with Adam Dunkley at Fife Council quite closely around some of those proposals. Um, so. We do work with, with Fife and all the local authorities very closely and they've been fully involved in, um, in, in working towards the Regional Skills Investment Plan that we launched fairly, fairly recently. I ask is that um, there are discussions ongoing at the moment as to whether or not Fife has benefited out of the Edinburgh City deal and I've got serious concerns about my own constituency so I just wonder you can't point to any specific projects or perhaps that's information you might be able to share with me after the, the committee, I, I don't know. Um, no, I can I can share. Uh, obviously, there are some co some confidentiality within what's yeah. what's in the deal, and the discussions are still underway. But there's proposals to share information uh, and employability services between local authority partners to try and join up and have a more integrated um, employability approach across all the different agencies. And that's something that Fife is is heavily involved in, and we're working through opportunities Fife and through the economy partnership uh, around that. Mm -hmm. And can I ask, would this work be happening were it not for the city region deal anyway? Because there is a question mark around whether or not the city region deals are providing additionality or are they plugging gaps? So was this something SES would have been doing anyway or is it something that's only come about because of the city deal? We'll be working with, with the local authorities and addressing some of the challenges within the labour market, but I think what the city deal gives is a framework for local authorities to come together and tackle problems which are common right across the region. Um, and look at how things can be joined up a bit better mm -hmm. and looking at where that additional investment could actually lead to a step change to address employment outcomes or underperformance in, in the labour market. Yeah. You, you'll know as well, I'm sorry, Kavita, this is very specific to Fife, but Fife is cut in two in terms of the city region deals with North East Fife being part mm -hmm. of the, the Tay deal um, and the rest of Fife being lumped in with Edinburgh. Does that mean that SDS have to deliver, develop their own specific programmes that reflect the city region deal makeup in that context? So we work with both the Tay Cities deal and the Edinburgh and South East Scotland city deal. And there's, uh, my understanding is that the North East section of Fife is um, in with the Tay Cities yep. deal. So the service we provide um, is um, specific to what's required within the region. Mm -hmm. So we would look at the Tay Cities region, we would look at the, the needs of North East Fife, and we would look to target resource and support where it's most appropriate to, to have that support targeted in the same way as we would with the rest of Fife as part of the, the city region. So we don't draw um, hard boundaries. Mm -hmm. We look at what's required and we deliver the service to meet those requirements. Thank you. OK, um, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, gentlemen. We've, we've touched on the growth, the investment and the inclusion and the skills. And all of the projects that are being talked about will have an identified one of these or not all of these to come part of the projects that are going forward. Can I ask about the projects? Are they truly new? Are they redeveloped, recycled or rehashed? And what would have happened if the deals hadn't come along? Okay. Um, well, I, I suppose the, the answer is a bit of a mixture. Um, city deals and growth deals are meant to be additional. Mm -hmm. So they're things which can go beyond what you would normally expect yep. local partners to be able to have the capacity to deliver. So there's something about scale, but there's also something about additional and new projects. And what we've got in the Ayrshire Grove deal, for example, is some genuinely mm -hmm. new projects. Okay. You know, um, the spaceport, for example, is exciting new opportunity for the whole of the UK and uh, that's certainly a new project. We're, 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 we're bidding to secure something called the Medicines Manufacturing Innovation Centre again which would be a, a one-off um, facility for the UK um, and um, you know again a new and exciting project and, and one which actually plays to our particular strengths in the local economy. Um, but you know we, we do have these long 
deep-seated problems which we've been struggling to address for a long period of time. And, and, and one of the earlier questions we had about market failure in terms of the commercial sector, uh, that there's things we can do to try and um, overcome those issues, but it's expensive. Um, and we have to go and invest significant amounts of money to begin to provide the types of accommodation which modern businesses need. But we also need to tie it up with some of those bigger projects like Spaceport, like MMIC, because they in themselves will become a magnet and that will begin to attract new rounds of investment. So if we've got a chance of reducing that scale of that market failure, then we need to marry some of those larger, more significant projects with that kind of base infrastructure. And that allows us to sort of draw the, the, the commercial property world in uh, and, and uh, secure further rounds of investment based upon the pump priming that we hope that the growth deal will, will, will provide. Um, as far as we're concerned, there's a large part of this is about where we sit internationally. Um, and particularly in Grangemouth's terms, Grangemouth's competition is in Europe, it's in Rotterdam, it's in Antwerp, it's, you know, in parts of France, Italy, Scandinavia, um, or it's in the Far East or, or US. So we're competing to try and attract business to attract investment to, to Scotland that will strengthen the capacity of uh, the chemicals sector particularly that will benefit the whole of the, the nation's economy. And it's an important signal is given to any investor about the capacity locally to make that investment a success. And so when they come, they want to see the best prospects to access the site, to deliver the site, to deliver in terms of the workforce and the, the productivity that, that they expect. And that's where, in our terms, this investment zone has to play in. We have to see this as, as enabling that kind of investment and demonstrating that there is an environment that these companies can be attracted to successfully. So, and that's been the, the play that we've made with the, the proposition that we have on the investment zone, that there are a number of investments needed to upgrade the infrastructure and to create the development platforms that will enable that, that kind of investment to succeed and also to deliver in terms of the skills and enterprise and promotional support that will in ensure that, that that works. And given the uncertainties in, in the national economy, this is, this is vitally important and it is you know, it, it, it important that we make a success of that. But there is an important part about making sure that that package does respect the needs of, of the, the community and helps it to move forward. So, you know, the point I've been making about um, fuel poverty, f for instance, is that this is the point in time when we should be looking at the, this locality for its next 20, 30 years and make the best prospect for investment then that safeguards that. And so some of these projects have been in gestation, but this is about galvanising that into a combined package, demonstrating what the economic gains are in jobs and in, uh, investment in productivity, and then using that as the justification. Part of that we're already doing through TIF. You know, we have seen through the TIF, um, you know, there's been new jobs, about 600 odd jobs created in the, in the TIF area currently, um, some new business space that has been provided. But this is about a next generation to that. This is, takes us beyond that. trying to exclude SDS, but that just seems to be a question specifically focused on, on, on the deals themselves. Do you want to follow up on that, Mr. Uh, Stewart? Just, just, just to carry on, the robustness of all of that uh, you've identified, uh, but if there is political change or there's policy change in the future, uh, how robust are we going to be? Uh, you know, as I say, we have the, the EU situation coming across us in the next few years. Uh, we could have a change uh, of government. We could have a change of di dimension. Uh, how robust are you to, to, to manage that if there is a change of policy or direction to ensure that they will continue to be uh, progressive and going forward and have the opportunities that you expect for the communities? Because within all of this, there's a massive expectation for communities that they're going to receive something and that that's going to make life better and it's going to give them opportunities going forward. But that 
has been dashed in the past when things haven't always come to fruition. And that's really the, the crux of the, the, the two I'm looking at here because you know, you're, you're in, you're in a, a situation where you, you're, you're attempting to move yourselves forward. Uh, you're not part of the bigger ones, but you've got the, the opportunity. But at the end of the day, you need to make sure you're successful. So a any concerns? Long-term financial sustainability is one of the, the great strengths mm -hmm. of this, but governments come and go, politicians come and go, partners come and go. How can you guarantee that continuity? I think it's a really important point. I think that that goes to the heart of, of the deal, isn't it? I mean, the deal is meant to be a long-term relationship between governments and the local local areas, local regional partnerships, or, or, or however it's constructed. Um, and I think that long-term view and that long-term commitment is the critical thing which can transcend individual policy changes or maybe changes of government. And I think probably some of this ties back to sort of Douglas's point, is that what we're trying to do is, is, is make Scotland as a whole more competitive and the regions within Scotland more competitive. Um, and the sort of heart of a lot of the city deal proposals or the types of mechanisms is putting in place that infrastructure to allow them to compete. So just as in Falkirk and, and, and the, the developments around about Grangemouth, you, you are competing on a European and world basis for inward investment, then actually so is Ayrshire, whether that's in pharmaceuticals or in aerospace or in space technology. And we need to make sure that we have the best possible chance of securing that investment. And it's a long-term game. You know, it, These things take a long time, but we need to put in place the infrastructure, we need to develop the sites, we need to have the, the premises which they can move into, and we need to surround that with the skills and the, all the other supporting services to make sure that we have the most viable, most attractive, and ready to invest in proposition that we can possibly put, put forward. And if we can do that, and we know we've got the backing of governments over a period of time, we can continue to, to refresh that. Um, and, of course, policies will change and we can adapt over time, but that core infrastructure is, is absolutely essential to what we need to be able to offer. Mr Duff? But just to add to that is that I would not belittle the importance of that in speaking to investors. Mm -hmm. You know, So as far as they're concerned, if they see a, a properly yes. galvanised support from the, the public bodies, from the business community, from the wider community in a locality that says this area is moving forward, that this infrastructure that is needed will be provided, that there's a package of support that is aligned. And, you know, we, we do hear from investors that they, they see this as, you know, in Scotland that we do relatively well. And we probably hide the joins quite often for them. But, you know, it is important that that is done well and that sense of commitment is, is there to them because they're doing the risk matrix back in, you know, whether that's in the Far East or US or whatever that says, is this aligned? Will it work? Will this investment work? And, and you know, to make that easy for them is vitally important. So, so having a signal that there is that commitment there um, will help to secure a positive decision. Um, and I won't leave any more deputy coming in to, to finish off a line of questioning in relation to skills, but I think a theme, Mr Gibson, a brief question, we'll take you in a second. No, just, uh, just on the issue, right, OK, so we'll take you in a second. But a lot of the theme, themes of questions have been around how we get community buy-in, how we get community benefit, how there's that inclusive growth. Um, Last week, I was very fortunate, unprompted, with the leader of Glasgow City Council, and who specifically picked areas in my constituency where there had been market failure, because in the likes of Ruck Hill and Hamilton Hill and Postle Park and Site Hill and Cowlairs, the market weren't inviting to develop. And that was partially because of significant issues with relation to drainage. So City Deal will be used in my constituency to make that land much more market ready. And I would anticipate seeing in the years ahead a significant number of both social and mid-market rent and owner-occupier houses coming into that area. So I, could, I will be able to point to that, saying here's how City Deal was delivered for my area and inclusive growth. I guess what we're all looking for around this table is being able to point to very specific examples in each of our areas and across Scotland. I suppose my question then to Mr Wiggins and Mr Duff is when we roll the clock forward two or three years, can you give me an, a, an example of identifiable communities where you think they'll say, 
this deal's benefited us and here's how it's done it. Uh, Mr. Oh, Wiggins. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I'll come back to the timescale in a minute because it, you know, sometimes these things... Five or ten years, years Whatever Mr. the, the timescale is. Yes. Okay, I mean, I, I think I'd point to two or three examples. I mean, one would be, uh, you know, there's no doubt about it, some, something like the spaceport. The UK is committed to have a spaceport operational by 2020. You know, we think Presswick is best place to be able to deliver that for the UK and generate most economic benefit because we have 50% of Scotland's aerospace employment in and around Presswick. So that would be a very iconic development and that would be something which you know we could point to and say that's what the growth deal delivered. If you go look at some of the other projects that we have, we have regeneration projects. We have probably the largest regeneration site in uh, the whole of Scotland which is the former Ardea Works, the ICI Works, the Nobel Explosives Plant. Um, and we're working closely with NPL Estates, who own that site, to bring forward a very large mixed-use scheme, um, which would have a mixture of housing, um, a mixture of leisure opportunities, a, leisure, a mixture of employment opportunities, and indeed some energy opportunities and, and the opportunity to look at district heating and, and so on and so forth. The unlocking of that site, which uh, I'm not sure... Uh, to give you some sense of scale of it, it's twice the size of a former Ravensclay plant. It's two and a half thousand acres of land. It would be a huge impact, not just in terms of a locality, but in terms of the whole of the west of Scotland and indeed the whole of Scotland. Um, what it needs is some key bits of infrastructure to open it up. And that's the components of the deal that we want to put in place. And once we've done that, of course, to develop out two and a half thousand acres of land will take a very, very long time. But actually, if you can put those bits of infrastructure in and begin to see development happen, then that's a big marker for the community as well because seeing things happen, seeing activity on the ground is a real boost for confidence. And uh, we want to try and, and build on that wherever we can. Yeah, um, three or four years might be a challenge. Some of this does take long, and I wouldn't a little just how long it does take to, to deliver on, on these things but uh, I mean I, I think tangible changes that we would expect to see are in Grangemouth that we are you know looking towards new chemicals operations coming forward at, at that site and you know some active discussions taking place around that hopefully more to come so I, th I think arising from the investments that we would see taking place we would hope to see those delivers delivered and jobs created as, as a consequence of, of that. In and amongst that, um, we are keen to look towards uh, the energy solutions for Grangemouth. It's the largest concentration of heat in Scotland. It emits about 4 million tonnes of carbon a year currently. We have to do something about that and there are active uh, dis discussions and, and activities take place to, to resolve that. But I mentioned fuel poverty in the course of coming forward with uh, energy solutions down there, we should also look towards the community benefit and district heating we see as, as one means of, of delivering on that. And I would hope in the course of, of this that we could see a solution there uh, in, the, the, in the relatively short to medium term. Um, I, I think another component to, to what we're doing is that town centres need to benefit. Very often they are the litmus test of, of an area's economy. People walking down the area's high street you know, want to see it healthy and, and performing well. And we would look through this work that, that, that is um, tackled in, in some way. We can't overcome all the pre uh, travails of the, of the retail sector in recent years, but we want to do what we can to, to enhance it, benefit from a variety of uses in town centre and look towards the, the nighttime economy, etc. So we'd look to see benefits there. Um, and, and I think... Also, what we'd, we'd be looking to do is bolster our performance in tourism. So the Kelpies have just had their three millionth visitor since opening in 2014. And we would look to, we have to sustain that and, and hopefully to grow it. And so we're thinking about next generation uh, types of, of tourism activities that will help to, to sustain that and grow. And that would certainly be involving the community and how that comes forward and they would hopefully see the benefit of it. Thank you very much. Uh, so to close this particular evidence session, we'll have a focus on skills. We're probably going to, we're overrunning by about 10 minutes. So in about 10 minutes' time, we'll have to close this session. My apologies to everyone and apologies to those that are waiting for the next evidence session. Aileen Smith. Oh, OK.
Kenneth Gibson was coming in. You're both on skills, so... Give me if you want. I mean, I was just wanting to ask what the deals will do for people workers aged over fifty, because as many uh, people have been in the labour force for twenty, thirty years, um, uh, deindustrialisation over the last two decades has meant they're no longer in the workforce, but they've still got a commitment to, and want to work. And I think a lot of them feel that they're perhaps being left behind by perhaps the focus on youth unemployment, which we discussed earlier on. So I'm just wondering what Skills Development Scotland are doing through the deals to try and get uh, older workers. Um, reskilled and back into um, the workforce. It is a theme that came out very strongly when we developed the regional <coughs> skills investment plan for for um, the city region deal in, in Edinburgh and the South East. Um, so it's it's definitely recognised as an issue. I think also recognising that there are people who are working for longer um, who, who who can't retire or don't wish to retire, and how can their skills be best used within the labour market? And I think part of the solution to that is to look at um, perhaps job redesign, reevaluation perhaps mentoring or even reverse mentoring in some cases to look at how those skills can be used and to encourage businesses to think about succession planning going forward. And I think by putting some effort and resource into that particular question, um, it will uh, affect productivity and growth within the economy because these are people that have a lot of very, uh, very useful uh, skills still to contribute. And for those who are not working and wishing to go back into the labour market, there's, there's resource and support to help them understand what opportunities are, what skills they might need to acquire to move back in, and then support to move them along the different stages of the, the employability and skills pipeline to, towards work or towards a different type of work using the skills that they have. And that could particularly be true for people, for example, who've worked in construction, who have come out of that through recession or through no fault or choice of their own and wish to move back in, looking at the skills that they have. And we also have the um, transition fund for oil and gas workers as well to try and help them move in the northeast back into other opportunities. So there's a number of initiatives that, that are, are there to try and support and help people in that particular category. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Elaine Smith. Thanks, convener. Um, skill, specifically to Skills Development Scotland, in your written submission, when you talk about the Glasgow and Clyde Valley City deal, um, you mention that you've worked with the group to develop a comprehensive skills investment plan and you talk about the wider economic development opportunities for the city region. So I wonder if you could maybe tell us a bit more about those wider opportunities that are out with the city itself. And also I'm interested in the point that Mr Duff made about town centres, because out with Glasgow City there are a number of... Um, town centres that, so, well, basically they're in decline. So I suppose maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Very much so. Thank you very much for the question. Um, it was a point earlier on that was made around uh, the, the the nature of delivery of the deals and, 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 and when SDS was able to be involved. Um, the Glasgow and Clyde Valley deal was obviously the first one that was signed in Scotland 2014. It was very much a partnership amongst the local authorities in the UK and Scottish governments. Um, but what I've been very pleased at is the uh, way in which partners have been open to SDS and indeed DWP and the colleges and others being involved in the structures that were set up initially around the assurance framework for the city deal to be more proactive in an approach to regional economic development and particularly for a, a skills plan for the for the city region. So I think what we've where we've come since 2014 is a situation where we now have um, a city deal but we also have a regional economic strategy and we also have a regional skills plan. Uh, and in both the regional economic strategy and the skills plan, the city deal and the city deal funded projects are important, but they're not exclusively about where the ambition lies in terms of the, the, the way forward and the work, work going forward. So um, the city deal itself funds, um, in, in, in Glasgow's case, primarily um, infrastructure projects. Basket, there's three innovation projects, three employability projects but the vast majority are, are infrastructure projects. They've been described elsewhere as drains, cranes, and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and trains, uh, referring to the airport, airport link. Um, and what the skills plan has tried to do is to sort of add, add, add particular value to that and look, and look beyond that piece. So beyond the specific um, infrastructure things funded by CEDIL, Deal, there is a, a, there's a, a range of other uh, projects, uh, many that are, are, are private sector-led, uh, many which are public sector-led. So the investment by um, 
uh, a range of partners network rail around the Queen Street development would be one in, in, in the city centre. Uh, the work that Renfrewshire Council's led around some of the infrastructure around the Design Museum, Paisley Museum, linked to the 2021 bid would be, would, would be another one. Uh, there's work aligned to the ports work out at, uh, at Inverclyde that's in place there. Um, there's the remediation of the former Exxon site at Western Bartonshire. In all of those cases, the, the, the city deal investment is, is, is but a trigger for a range of other activities that are in place there. And the regional economic strategy and the skills plan looks uh, at both the investments that go through the city region piece, but also much more, much more widely than that. So what the skills plan tries to do is to pick up on um, a number of things that working collectively and collaboratively, uh, all partners can do to ensure that we uh, do secure inclusive growth, we do secure prosperity, uh, and we look to increase GVA for the city region. So um, a, 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 an understanding of the nature of the pipeline of projects and the jobs that will come forward from construction and ancillary trades and ensuring that our training providers and colleges are preparing people for moving forward in that. That's something that's not been done on this, on this scale before. A sense around the key sectors that are still crucially important, which yes are concentrated on Glasgow City Region, but which actually have a have a footprint right beyond that, and how we ensure that there's a, a regional approach to that. So, for example, within life and chemical sciences, we absolutely look to to Airship and some of the investments that were being talked around there, and how the supply chain will benefit Glasgow City Region companies across the region and Airship, and indeed out to Grangemouth as well beyond, because that that is the access point for for some of those works. Um, I mentioned earlier on around financial and business services, and again, there's a, a cluster in, in, in Glasgow City, but there's uh, a, a, a contact centres and other installations that run right down through um, uh, Inverclyde uh, and elsewhere as well. The visitor strategy is very explicitly around boosting tourist nights, d doubling the number of, of, of tourist visits by making the city region a destination rather than the city itself, and playing on the the regional assets and the wider range of things that are in, in, in place there. Uh, Western Bartonshire, um, further development around some of the work in Balakot, Loch Lomond, around innovative visitor attractions that might be there. The whole point being that it's not just a, 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 an investment and development that will benefit Western Bartonshire, it's one that will add to the value of the, of the city region piece. And that's, and that's a theme that runs, runs right through that. So our skills piece is, is looking at how we um, train up young people and retrain older and, uh, and other people into the jobs that we know are coming forward, um, both in terms of um, you know, the replacement demand as things move forward, but, but crucially in terms of where, that, where those growth sectors are uh, and ensure that there's a, a, a pipeline of talent that can be come through that matches both to public sector investment, but, but critically also to the private sector uh, attractions that will come forward. And that's region-wide, not just city centre itself. Okay, thanks. And I think you've possibly answered this question in terms of your response to Mr Gibson to a certain extent, but is there anything that Skills Development Scotland would like to suggest um, that, that might make improvements to enhance skills and employability activity across the city region deals? Or is this usually the convener would ask, is there anything else that you feel hasn't been asked that you want to add at this point? And just a comment on the sort of the, the, the alignment around that, I think one of the things that, that I've been really keen to see is, is the willingness of the aid authorities to work together in partnership with SDS and with other agencies to try and look at a, um, a, you know, a proposition that's fit for the current and future economy uh, of that area. So there have been some demonstrator projects that are funded through City Deal in Glasgow and Clyde Valley, Working Matters, which addresses people who are long term uh, away from the labour market around upskilling in, in, in care jobs, so people can move out of the poverty trap of, of low-wage employment and, and develop, as well as the projects around Youth Gateway, uh, which has been a focus across, across the country. There are things we can absolutely learn from that. The ambition going forward is, 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 is that we continue to work in partnership and, and, and really realise the possibilities for the whole of the region. Thanks. And look, wrapped up in that, uh, Deputy Convener, you had asked, uh, given, did give a name check to town centres. And I, I don't know if there was a reply you were waiting on that. Yes, uh, if there, you want to add anything specifically about town centres, yeah, particularly those that was, are in decline. I think it was Mr Duff that was, that was name-checked there, yes. Town centre scars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, they are integral to our economic strategy, you know, so, so we, we have 
um, as, as a council, and I know many councils up and, and down the country um, are actively seeking to tackle the needs and meet the needs of their town centres. I would highlight the work of Scotland's Towns Partnership, you know, which sits alongside the work of the Cities Alliance, and I think that you know relationship we sometimes we don't quite get, but um, you know, I, I think they they have done quite considerable work to highlight the needs of town centres across the country and the need to galvanise support for, for them to promote the likes of the, the work of bids. You know, so business improvement districts are highlighted in the, the briefing and that they have created you know, very strong networks of business uh, interests who are keen to promote uh, their town centre and councils work very actively with them around the country. Probably more to come there, more, more potential. But um, you know, certainly, we do see town centres as integral to the needs of an economy, and uh, we we do and will expect through the work on, on the likes of investment zone to see that investment channel towards is sustaining them. And I won't, Mr. Wiggins, I won't take you in here, Mr. Wiggins, because because time is upon us. But I just want to get the opportunity to put something about town centres on the record there. And every time town centres are are, are mentioned. Uh, I, I should say that I also note that town centres, a planning definition in the cities have also got town centres out with the city centre. So when we look at town centres, mm -hmm. we need to look at them in the round. And it did give me the opportunity to put that on the record. <laughs> uh, also, very, very helpful evidence session. We, we very, very uh, much appreciate your, your input here today. I would normally give you the opportunity to make final comments. Well, we're now way beyond time. Please do follow the inquiry. Please do email the clerk and team with any additional comments that you wish to make. Thank you very much. So we move now from agenda item one, but we'll suspend briefly before we move to agenda item two. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. We now move to agenda item two, which is Scottish Housing Regulator Annual Report and Accounts 2016-17. So uh, we'll take evidence from the Scottish Housing Regular on Annual Report and Accounts. Uh, and can I welcome George Walker, uh, Chair, and Michael Cameron, Chief Executive, Scottish Housing Regulator. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming along, and thank you for your patience, slightly over running today. And can I invite the Chair uh, an opportunity to make some opening remarks, please, Mr Walker. Thank you, Convener. Uh, well, Convener, Vice Convener and Committee, indeed, thank you very much for inviting us along today to present the annual report and accounts for, for the last year, 2016-17. As you'll know, I took over as Chair of the Scottish Housing Regulator from Mrs K Blair in July. We had a, a, a good effective handover period, and I stepped into the chair, if you like, from August this year. So I'm, I'm a relatively uh, new boy there. I enjoyed a great handover, was pleased to find a well-run and effective regulator with a high-quality board, I must say, and, and more importantly, with very clear focus on protecting tenants and service users' interest. That's what we're about, after all. So I'm delighted to present the annual report and accounts for 2016-17 to you this morning. I'd like to highlight just a few things. First, the work that SHR did to empower tenants and draw landlord attention to the issues that are important to tenants like rent affordability, for example. Next, the positive practice that SHR has highlighted to help landlords develop new homes sustainably and so, of course, contribute to the Scottish Government's affordable housing target. Um, SHR also has worked hard to maintain the confidence of those who invest and lend to the sector. That's vital. And lastly, SHR has used the statutory intervention powers given to it by Parliament to protect the interests of tenants and, 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 of course, the good reputation of the sector. Now, we're very pleased to take any questions that you might have for us in the annual report, but if I may, I'd like to just highlight some more current issues and emerging issues for, for the regulator. First, we start a review of our regulatory framework. That's the framework around which we regulate. It was published in uh, 2012, and we committed at that time that we would review this framework as we went forward. Right now, we're generating ideas with our stakeholders. In January, we'll publish a discussion paper and we'll then follow with a formal proposal and consultation in the second half of 2018. Um, this works timely. Um, it will reflect our experience and, and what we've learned as regulators over the past five years and in the changes in the operating context for social landlords and over that time. We want to build on the successes of, of, of our framework and, of course, strengthen to adjust and respond to new challenges. We know that social landlords continue to perform well across almost all of the standards and outcomes of the Charter. 14 of 16 outcomes improved last year. We also know that most are managing their resources to ensure their own financial well-being. However, we're actively engaging with one in eight registered social landlords right now primarily on serious governance issues. We've had to use our statutory intervention powers in seven landlords over the past three years. So throughout our review, we want to look at what more we can do, and maybe more importantly, what boards of social landlords themselves can do before we need to become involved. We'll also review and take account of the changes, of course, likely to be introduced by the, the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill. And I understand we'll speak about that further when we, we meet the committee again on the 29th of November. So just very quickly, some early themes that are emerging from our discussion with stakeholders that you might be interested to hear about. That would include issues such as self-assessment against the regulatory standards, strong internal audit, active risk management, and the positive use of whist whistleblowing uh, within organisations. Tents remain at the heart of the work, of our work rather, and so it won't surprise you that a strong emerging theme from our early discussions is that of tenant safety. We're actively working now to promote this agenda and we're pleased to see that actually this is very much at the forefront of our stakeholders' uh, current agendas too. We'll keep you certainly updated with the, as we progress through the review. I wanted to mention homelessness just very quickly. Um, I know it's an issue close to the hearts of this committee in particular. Like you, we certainly appreciate the complexity of homelessness and welcome its prominence in the recent programme for governance, government. Rather. We're committed to do all we can within the, the limitations of our remit and to use all our influence to drive the types of change that we all want to see. And I, I would imagine that you may well have some questions for us on homelessness later in the session. 
Finally, and just to wrap up, I want to highlight rent affordability. I think the committee will be well aware that inflation's now hit 3%. The October numbers were announced yesterday. Uh, changes to the welfare system uh, present real difficulties for many tenants. And tenants are absolutely telling us that they're concerned about future rent increases. So we're looking to social landlords to understand what is affordable for their tenants and to consider this when uh, determining rent levels. That will mean landlords giving tenants genuine options and choices during rent consultation, discussing the balance between value for money and service levels and demonstrating to tenants and to us how they take tenant views into account. Well, convener, I don't want to hog the floor. I wanted to keep my, my remarks uh, uh, short. So I'll hand back to you, but thank you for the opportunity to meet with you this morning and present a report. I just wanted to cover those few uh, issues that were at the top of my and SHR's agenda right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Walker. I think, I think it sets a very good context and mirrors some of the, the thoughts I think you'll find the committee has as well. So that's very welcome. We'll move to questions now and Andy Whiteman to open up the questioning. Uh, thanks, Convener, and thanks for coming along today. Um, you mentioned in your opening remarks empowering tenants, and I just want to ask you know, a couple of questions on that. I mean, what are the key things that you, the regulators, are doing uh, to empower tenants to hold landlords to account? There's a number of areas where, where we do that. Um, I, I guess I'd summarise it by saying that we believe that active tenants working closely with landlords scrutinising performance plays a crucial role in shaping and improving housing services ultimately. There's a number of things we do to empower tenants. Um, first is that, is that building on the concept of tenant-led scrutiny, and it's fast becoming a pretty well-established um, part of the social housing uh, landscape in, in Scotland, if you like. We aim to empower tenants by giving them first good information on the performance of the landlords and promoting tenants having a very strong voice. So some examples of that would be that we publish a landlord report on every landlord. Last year, I think we published 100 and more than 180, 186, I think is the number, landlord reports. So that gives them background on, the, on their, their individual landlords. Um, we've developed an online comparison tool so that tenants can compare their landlord with a landlord down the street or, in, or in, the, in the next area. That tool was visited about all nearly 29,000 times last year. So it tells us it's being well used and certainly we hear from tenants that it helps them to better understand landlords' performance uh, and where they look to improve. Um, we did work with tenants to develop the landlord reports that I referred to, and we included in that the most important indicators that, that or the indicators they told us were were most important to, to them. So they would be the, pri the primary focus of how we would look to empower tenants, largely driven by information and access to information. Thank you. That's uh, that's very useful. I mean, I've looked at these landlord reports and uh, the comparison tool, and I think they are. Uh, very useful, but beyond providing good information to enable tenants to find out more about their landlord and how it's providing, I was interested to look at the question of actual membership of registered social uh, landlords. And I noted that in some of the larger RSLs, Build Housing and Care, for example, has got 4,690 homes, um, but only 74 members and only 21 people turned up to the AGM. Um, Hillcrest, 6,101 homes, only 88 members, 32 turned up to the AGM. Uh, but among some of the smaller associations, you have an Antonine Housing Association with 334 homes, 278 members. Virtually every tenant is a member of their RSL, and 53 turned up to the um, annual general meeting. Rural Stirling Housing Association as well, quite good. So, I mean, that, I mean, ultimately, if tenants are empowered, arguably you don't need a regulator. Arguably, you don't need a regulator because they are in control of their landlord. So are you satisfied with the level of membership that tenants have of the organisation that is their landlord? And what are the trends over time? I've indicated that there may be trends whereby smaller housing associations have got much, much better levels of uh, membership compared to large ones. I'll maybe make a... Sorry. Uh, not needing a regulator is not an official committee position, just before you answer that, that question. 
you know, even as chair of a regulator, actually, if regulators weren't necessarily necessary in Scotland because everything was working so effectively, I, I, do, I don't think too many of us would object to that thought. Um, but th let me make a couple of comments, and, uh, and, and then maybe Michael will have something to add as well. Um, from a personal perspective, I think we would always want uh, membership participation to rise wherever possible. There is no doubt that amongst the uh, smaller, perhaps one might describe them as more community-based RSLs, that that level of participation, as, as you've highlighted, uh, Mr Whiteman, is, is that bit higher. Certainly, one would worry that with the, the bigger, um, are they maybe more corporate style um, RSLs, that connectivity uh, to tenants is uh, maybe a little less. Um, suffice to say, we would certainly want to actively encourage RSLs in a couple of areas. Firstly, to have tenants represented uh, through their scrutiny panels. Um, secondly, absolutely to have tenants participating in boards, as indeed we do ourselves. Um, but thirdly, I, I think, as you rightly say, to push up membership where they can. So I think those would be areas that we would agree and would want to encourage. Michael, I don't know if you had any thoughts on any of the trends or, or some of the more detailed aspects. Perhaps just to add that um, landlords in Scotland have a range of different rules um, and constitutions that um, uh, affect the level of membership that, um, that they can have. But regardless of that, what we would look to landlords to do is to ensure that they maximise all opportunities for tenants and other service users um, to participate and to be involved in the organisation at the levels that they find most appropriate for them. So we're seeing quite a significant development uh, around tenant-led scrutiny, scrutiny panels um, in landlords that are in addition to those more formal routes of participation through membership and uh, becoming a part of uh, the organisation's board or committee. Uh, and we would look to landlords to continue to maximise those opportunities uh, for all tenants to, to become involved uh, in whatever way they feel is most appropriate for them. I mean, do, do you have a view on the extent to which their constitution should allow tenants to become members of the organisation? I mean, it was difficult for me to find out some of this data because some of them are cooperative and mutual associations and it cost you £12 pounds, um, to download their annual return or accounts. So I, I didn't pay £12. Pounds. Um, so it's quite difficult. I and mean, for, for tenants, they can't even find out the constitution or the annual return of their... Glasgow Housing Association, for example, is one of these. It costs you £12 pounds per um, uh, item. I mean, do you have a view on whether the constitution should allow tenants to be members? Because this, this whole movement started as a more community-based uh, movement. I think, I think the view of the regulator is set out in regulatory standards, um, and uh, all landlords have to ensure that their constitutional arrangements adhere. To the regulatory standards. Those standards are um, well understood in the sector um, and supported uh, almost uh, entirely within the sector. So uh, from our perspective, a landlord needs to adhere um, to, to those um, uh, regulatory standards. Um, I should say that um, as a regulator, we publish all annual accounts from all uh, registered social landlords, so uh, that's freely available on our website, um, as are um, a number of other constitutional documents that are set out for every landlord. So um, rather than pay £12, perhaps visit our, visit our own website. OK, thanks um, uh, very much. I mean, what, what evidence, just finally, do you have that um, tenants are using the charter results to hold their landlords to account and scrutinise their performance? I mean, apart from the numbers of visits, etc. I mean, that's have a look. It's interesting, obviously, people are looking at it, but what actual evidence do you have that people are then using that information in a constructive way to engage with their landlord? I think we've an, it, it's an excellent question, uh, and I think we have a number of sources of that. It, it, as you said, visits to, to the website uh, and so on is part of that. Um, I think more importantly, what we hear when we engage with a variety of tenant organisations, um, our own tenant panel, we have a panel of, of um, almost 500 tenants who we engage with, if you like, and guide us and give us feedback on our documentation, how we work, etc., etc. 
we hear from them on how useful the tools are. And I think really importantly, actually, when we, intend, when we attend events, for example, I spoke, uh, my first major speech as chair was at the, the TPAS conference, one of the major tenant uh, bodies in St Andrews a couple of weeks ago. And that was exactly the theme I was talking about. And in the Q&A there, a lot of the commentary I was getting back from tenants was on how useful they found some of the tools we gave them to some extent giving them the confidence to ask some of those vital first questions um, because I, I you know um, one man I, I actually said to him you know it, it, because I read my landlord's report at, at your website the SHR website that gave me the information and the confidence to start asking uh, my landlord about things without that I would have been a bit hesitant so I think we have a number of sources of that and and it's certainly something that we we actively um, encourage is that level of engagement okay thanks Eileen Smith thanks convener thanks for joining us um, as you thought Mr Walker I do want to turn to homelessness but first of all could I follow up on just um, the line of questioning that Andy Whiteman was taking with you there. And I just want to ask about the whistleblowing. You mentioned whistleblowing at the start in your presentation to us. And also, I noticed Mr Cameron has specifically been quoted on whistleblowing as well. Could I just ask, um, why do you think, to get my head around why whistleblowing would be necessary, is this tenants who might be concerned that they would lose their tenancy if they were to officially complain about something? What sort of issues, if you can tell us that, I don't know how confidential some of this is, but what sort of issues might people whistleblow on? I, I think there's a number of areas. I'm, I'll make a couple of remarks, and I'm, I'm sure Michael might, might have some more specifics. Um, we would see whistleblowing, if you like, as part of a suite of feedback loops. And, and part of that is feedback from tenants to landlords, feedback from tenants to us as the regulator, feedback between regulator and housing provider, but importantly, feedback from staff. And often, in my experience, certainly from my corporate background, um, cultures, open cultures are needed for whistleblowing to work effectively. I, I think what, what I, I have seen so far, and, and I'll maybe ask Michael to comment on this in more detail, is that a number of the statutory interventions that we as, as a regulator have made have been based on whistleblowing. For example, in the last uh, year, the year we're talking about in this annual report, we had eight instances of whistleblowers coming to um, SHR. What that tells me as chair is that um, the internal whistleblowing and the culture within the organisations themselves maybe aren't as effective as they could be if those whistleblowers feel that they have to come to SHR. So it's a very useful source of intelligence for us as a regulator, but it's a mechanism certainly we would like to see working even more effectively as we roll forward within organisations themselves. Perhaps just to, to add to that, particularly from the, the tenant perspective, we wouldn't necessarily um, uh, look or describe a, a tenant approaching us as, as a whistleblowing. We have a number of routes that, that tenants are able to take to raise concerns. Um, the first thing that we would always encourage a tenant to do is to raise the concern directly with their landlord. Um, and we set out quite clear expectations on landlords around uh, how they should be managing um, complaints and, and we work very closely with the ombudsman um, in, in that regard. Um, but also we give tenants a route to raise what we describe as significant performance failures where perhaps it's less about an individual tenant's complaint and more about um, tenants bringing forward evidence of where there's a systemic failure on the part of a landlord, where it's failing to do something or um, where it's it's doing something ineffectively. And that has a, 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 an impact on the wider um, body of, of tenants and that uh, landlord. So those are other routes that we ensure we provide. And they tend, to, they tend to be used by tenants where either they have exhausted the, 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 the routes that are available to them with the landlord, or they feel that those routes aren't genuinely accessible. But clearer then, convener, so you might be talking about a member of staff whistleblowing about a discriminatory allocations policy, for example, that kind of issue, rather than tenants, because I wasn't clear why tenants might want to whistleblow. 
Um, you know, it, it's very much about um, members of staff, um, former or current members of staff, or indeed members of a, a, an organisation's governing body, bringing serious matters to our attention that would generally relate to um, a failure to comply with our regulatory standards. Thanks. And moving on to um, homelessness issues, if I may. Could I ask what evidence you have about the effectiveness of local authority homelessness services? Because the committee has heard some evidence. Um, we're doing an inquiry, as you'll know, into homelessness. And we have heard some evidence that people are not able to access their, their statutory homelessness rights in, in cases. Have you? What, what sort of um, evidence do you have about that? Has, has that been exercising you at all? Absolutely. It's been a, a key area of focus um, for us for a, a number of years now. Um, and it, it's probably worth saying that our, uh, our sense is that the um, many people who experience homelessness do get uh, a good service um, from local authorities and uh, an outcome that meets their needs uh, at that point in time. But it, that's not universally the case. Uh, and we... Um, we know that, for example, the use of temporary accommodation is increasing, um, and we know that there are more uh, families with children um, being accommodated in temporary accommodation. This year, we are engaging with 18 councils um, around homelessness, and some of the issues that we're engaging um, on um, are about that increase in the use of temporary accommodation, particularly the increase in the use of bed and breakfast uh, accommodation, um, issues around access um, to temporary and emergency accommodation, um, high levels of repeat applications, um, increasing time spent in temporary accommodation, and also high levels of, of lost contacts where somebody has, a, uh, um, has applied for assistance but then um, seems to, to, to uh, lose contact with the, with the council. Those are all issues that we're currently engaging uh, with councils on uh, in the current year. Your mini report, um, the Homelessness Services Experience of Service Users, have, have you found that useful then in informing the way you've been approaching this? Uh, absolutely. The, the research gave us um, a fantastic insight into um, service users' experiences. Um, and, and again, it's worth stressing that most told us that they had positive experiences and, and in particular they found their engagement with um, staff delivering the service um, to be positive uh, and they felt supported. Perhaps one of the big um, conclusions that, 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 that came out of that research was that many people who are experiencing homelessness do suffer a level of, of distress that's caused by the amount of time that they may have to spend in temporary accommodation awaiting a, a permanent solution um, to their, their situation and that sense that their life is put on hold uh, until that um, outcome is achieved. So in the back of that, we've um, ensured that our annual risk assessment of local authorities' performance in homelessness um, identifies uh, um, those uh, councils where there are above average or lengthy waits in temporary accommodation, and we've brought those issues to those councils. Although I do note in the report that a minority of participants did report difficulties in actually accessing yeah. homeless services. Um, I wonder then, on just on the back of what you said there, Mr Cameron, if there's, is there specific problems in areas where the local authorities have the statutory duty for homelessness, but they don't actually have any houses? So, for example, in areas of stock transfer, uh, where the, the local authority doesn't, isn't the landlord, is that... Is that an area where there are specific issues? I think in, in some of the locations where that's the case, um, there can be particular issues, and we are currently working um, with uh, Glasgow City Council uh, around some of the challenges that are uh, being experienced by homeless people, particularly in terms of um, the movement from the assessment um, as requiring assistance into finding permanent solution. The council obviously um, looks to its um, RSL partners um, to help it discharge its duties in that regard. And we're doing quite a bit of work in, uh, in the council at the moment. 
We do stress the importance um, of RSLs recognising um, their responsibilities um, to assist councils, um, all councils, um, uh, but particularly in those circumstances where the council has uh, no housing stock uh, of its own. It's critically important that those partnerships uh, are effective and focused on delivering the right outcomes for homeless people. Actually, going to be my final question on this issue as to whether or not you think you need to do more work on finding out whether RSLs are um, coming up to the mark in this regard and assisting local authorities to meet their statutory duty. That, that's an important part of our annual risk assessment. We look at the information we have uh, in relation to the, the level of lets that are, are made um, to homeless people by both local authorities and RSLs um, to help us better understand where those um, arrangements are working well or where they're uh, not working so well. In Glasgow, uh, we're doing a piece of work um, where we are uh, looking at the, the kind of end-to-end -end journey of a homeless person from the point where they're referred by the council to uh, an RSL um, and sometimes back again um, so that we can uh, better understand uh, where that works well and where that works effectively, but also where there are some failure points in that process or some barriers to effective um, solutions. Um, we're in the midst of that work, so it's too early to, to draw any firm conclusions at the moment. Um, uh, and we'll be feeding back to the relevant uh, partners in Glasgow in December um, around our, our conclusions, and in particular where we've identified uh, improvements that are needed by the Council or indeed by RSLs um, to ensure that the, the process works effectively. What we'll also do uh, is share any positive practice we find out of that more widely uh, with other councils and RSLs to ensure that they can uh, uh, learn from, from that. Uh, and we'll continue to take account of all the information we gather through that and how we then engage with individual RSLs and the local authority. Thanks. I think the convener wanted to specifically ask about that, but maybe we could have the information on that once you finish the work that you're doing on it. Happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah, that's I'll just mop up one or two things around that. Obviously, being a Glasgow member of the Scottish Parliament, I've, I have a constituency interest in this area. The first thing I suppose we would ask is, you know, the Scottish Housing regularly will report back to the local authority and how it's managing that homelessness pathway and undertaking its statutory duties and recommend areas of improvement, commend areas of good practice. But there have obviously been issues within, within Glasgow that that's self-evident. Will that report become public? It, th this this work won't necessarily deliver a formal report. Um, uh, we're trying to be um, very agile in terms of moving through quickly with this and getting the right information out. But I'm very happy to share the conclusions of that with the committee. Okay, that's helpful. Just I, mean, I don't want to kind of not 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 that you would be bound. I don't want to bounce the Scottish Housing Regulator into a commitment when I mean, you have to check with Glasgow City Council what the rules of engagement are. But I think it would be helpful if whatever information we got became public information because this committee might decide if, if a summary of themes, topics, issues, challenges, whatever emerged from that rather than a formal report, we might decide to get the relevant partners in Glasgow to the committee to discuss that in a constructive way. So it would be important for that information not just to be extended in private to the committee, but to become a public document. Would that be your intention? Uh, absolutely. Right. That, that's, that's very helpful. That said, is there any emerging themes you want to share with the committee just now, or we keep your powder dry till you speak to the local authority in December? I, I think I'd want to ensure that we've fully analysed all the information um, uh, uh, and tested our emerging conclusions fully before I, I put anything on the record. You'll understand why I would ask that question, but I appreciate that as a as a relevant answer. Um, I suppose I should just check uh, in terms of statutory duties. The vice convener mentioned uh, the statutory sitting with local authorities. Is the housing regular sympathetic to making that a joint statutory duty along with uh, other social landlords, rather than sitting solely with the local authority? That's that's that would be a matter for government. Um, I think what we would then do, uh, if that were to be um, the position, we would absolutely regulate on that basis. Uh, I mean, clearly our, our, our expectations on RSLs is that they participate fully uh, and contribute meaningfully um, to alleviating homelessness in their local areas and that they work constructively with, uh, with the, the local authority to achieve that. So that, that will continue to be the basis in which we engage in this important area.
Yeah, and just a little bit more on that. Does does the, the, does the regulator uh, share or observe best practice in in, in social landlords monitoring that that they're meeting their responsibilities, if not statutory duties, in relation to homelessness? So one example, without naming the housing association, I think that'd be unfair in this public forum. The mechanism would be if the housing association accepted a Section Five referral on behalf of a homeless individual or family, then if under their choice-based letting system where only certain properties are put into the homelessness group, if the individual or family doesn't bid on a property and secure it within six weeks, the social landlord will do that on their behalf and they'll be accepted to take it. So is there kind of national guidance and rules that would say, I mean, that does concern me, I have to say, is there national guidance and rules where the regulator would go, that's acceptable, not acceptable, has concerns, doesn't have concerns. So that's just one example. There's lots of examples out there. Is that something the regulator would take a view on? Well, I think what what, what we would look to uh, in terms of how we would assess whether a landlord was meeting its um, statutory duties or its responsibilities, I say, in this, in this regard, um, uh, is both the, uh, the relevant legislation but also the guidance that's been published by the Scottish Government, in particular in this regard, there's the Code of Guidance on Homelessness. Um, having said that, um, I think there's there's a lot of activity going on um, in this area. Uh, housing options um, as an approach is now becoming well developed. Um, we have choice-based lettings that operate um, across a number of different areas and, and landlords. There's also the work um, that will be emerging from the Ministerial Action Group. And all of that suggests to me that there may be some value in looking at whether the Code of Guidance on Homelessness needs to be refreshed to ensure that it takes account of all of these um, developments that we see happening in homelessness. Well, two, two further questions, I'm afraid. But one would be uh, the terminology that, that I get again as a constituency MSP is it has to be a reasonable offer for the offer to count, whether that means it's an elderly person who would have to leave their local support network or a family with the children would be have to move to the other side of the city and be taken out of school. So there's a whole variety of criteria that may deem a, a reasonable offer. I'm just wondering if, if, if your feeling is out there that when a, a housing officer or someone from the homeless team says to someone, this is your offer, um, you have to accept this or we will discharge your duty to house you under homeless legislation, whether that's a light and shade conversation that says, do, do you accept this as a reasonable offer? And there's that dialogue over what a reasonable offer looks like. Because if I was a homeless individual and I thought the local authority was going to walk away at that point, I might be scared to rock the boat and say, I don't feel this is a reasonable offer. And those that do rock the boat come to their MSPs, of course, uh, and good on them for doing that. So uh, is there guidance and support and training <laughs> in relation to local authorities and housing associations and what deems a reasonable offer? What monitoring is on the system to make sure that that actually happens on the ground in practice? The, there is guidance um, in, in relation to what constitutes a reasonable offer. Um, and that, again, is set out in the Code of Guidance. Um, with, whether that um, guidance is um, fully up to date in taking account of the different type of arrangements that there now are in terms of allocating um, social housing, you mentioned particular choice-based lettings. Um, yeah, I think the developments have been such over the last few years that, 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 that we're probably approaching a point where um, a refreshed code of guidance would be of significant value. Um, and then the type of uh, dissemination and training of that guidance uh, would follow on from that. MSPs only get the negative cases. People never come to us and say, you know, Bob had a great experience. My pathway through this horrible homelessness situation was superb. That's not what happens. We only get the negative cases. So I, I realise that people's experiences, our experience is coloured by those who come who come to us. But specifically in relation to, to homelessness, uh, Mr Walker, I, I, I was very interested to hear your use of language in your opening statement where you said you're keen to continue along this road based on the limitations of your remit. And that does beg the question whether you you think it would be helpful or to at least have a discussion about how the remit could be extended, and if so, what that, re that extension could look like. 
Yeah, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. Um, what I was really alluding to there is, is that we, we absolutely, as a regulator, recognise the complex area that is homelessness and therefore the multi-agency approach that needs to take place around that. Um, and that it's not for us as a regulator to mandate particular things around it, but to operate within the remit and the, the charter, et cetera, et cetera. It was a recognition that we would want to work as part of a multi-agency approach to, to homelessness. As an example of that, as it happens, Michael and I were at a, a meeting with a, a significant RSL who was uh, running out recently in Scotland, who was running a pilot on uh, Homes First. And we're talking about that. And one of the big points that they were making to us, and, and they, they were seeing some good results in that pilot, was about the need for all the support mechanisms that sat behind that. Uh, and of course, that discussion ensued. And that was a recognition of there's a limit to where the, the regulator's role begins and ends around homelessness. But we need to work with other bodies because it's such a complex area. And I don't need to be patronising to, to a committee of this knowledge and experience because I know that you, you've done so much work in homelessness recently so I'm well aware you, you know that. They're just floating the idea of additional remits for, mm. for, for the regulator just to give you the opportunity there. Uh, we'll move on to further line of questioning. Uh, Graham Simpson. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I just want to um, quickly look at uh, rents if we can and the, the level of rents and the affordability. Um, I note that uh, the average uh, rent in the RSL sector is £11 a week higher than it is in uh, council housing. Um, you did a survey um, earlier this year um, where you found about uh, a third uh, of tenants had experienced rent affordability issues at some point. Uh, one in eight uh, had had difficulties in the last year and 66% uh, were worried about... Uh, future rent affordability problems. So um, I just wonder if you can tell us uh, what your remit is um, uh, around around rents uh, and, and controlling them uh, and, you know, looking at uh, affordability issues. I'll maybe open by, by just saying that uh, what, what is interesting is that tenants certainly tell us that they're worried about rent affordability. The themes that come up in that are possi possible future rent increases, levels of income rising or not rising, as, as, as we know has been the case, and of course changes to benefits has an impact too. So we're certainly hearing that. What feeds into that is the whole idea of value for money. And in fact, the last piece of significant research that we published recently from our tenant panel that I referred to, this group of about 500, was around the whole idea of um, affordability and and um, uh, sorry, uh, value for money and how they looked at that. It's certainly very much on our radar uh, at the moment in as much as the reference I made to inflation hitting 3% recently. Uh, and that's certainly something that we will be quite vocal about. And we have always taken the view that we wanted uh, housing providers to look at rent affordability for the long term. It's not a one-year gig. It's looking at for long term affordability. And indeed, I was speaking at that at a conference to housing providers on Friday. Michael, I think, though, has quite a lot of, of detailed information around this and some of the work that we've been doing. And it's important to say that we, we, we pay close attention to rent levels and in particular proposed uh, increases in rent um, from social landlords when we are undertaking our annual risk assessment um, of all landlords. Uh, and, and we will engage with a landlord where we have concerns about the particular level of rent um, increase that may be getting proposed. Having said that, our, our, current, our, our sense at the moment is that current rent for most homes is affordable for most tenants. Um, and if we look at um, levels of arrears, um, we can see that they're relatively static at the moment. That may be evidence to support that sense. Having said that, um, and as uh, uh, George has already touched on, we're well aware of some of the challenges that are coming forward um, in terms of tenants' incomes um, and also the sense that tenants are, are communicating to us around their, their concern uh, about future rent affordability. And that's why uh, our messaging um, to tenants, uh, to, to landlords has very much been about um, considering 
um, future affordability, uh, the future ability of tenants to continue to pay their rent. Uh, and that's a, that's a theme that we will um, stay on as a regulator and continue to engage with, with landlords about. Is, is there anything to stop um, RSLs setting whatever rents they, they like? The, the, there's uh, not a national rent policy in Scotland. Um, and therefore, there aren't um, those type of constraints um, on landlords. Um, as I say, we would take um, a, a, an interest if we saw what we considered to be excessive um, rent increases. Um, as I say, we, we, we not, not a sense that this is on the agenda of, of landlords um, to be looking at um, very, very significant rent increases. Um, we um, gather in um, financial projections from all registered social landlords, um, and in that we can um, determine a sense of the projected rent increases that they're thinking on. Over the last few years, um, the level of those projected rent increases has been reducing. Having said that, our analysis of the most recent set of projections shows that um, going up again to about 2.9%. So that's that's why we're flagging this as an important issue at this point, uh, and that when landlords are considering uh, rents for future years, they ensure that they have meaningful engagement with tenants um, around um, what what tenants view as value for money in terms of the rent they're getting and the level of service they're getting, um, but also um, to ensure that they take account of the sustainability um, of, of those kind of rent levels for tenants into the future. So do you do you think there the should be something in place to you know, constrain uh, any RSLs who want, wanted to, you know, impose mass massive rent increases? Well, I, as I said, I, I, it, that rent controls would be a matter for the Scottish government and indeed for this Parliament to consider. Um, what what I, I I think in terms of the regulatory position at the moment is that that we don't see any great um, rush by landlords to look at excessive uh, rent increases. I think uh, most landlords are very mindful of um, the, the impact that rent increases have on their tenants. Um, uh, but we will look um, to engage with any landlord that we think may be um, um, pushing rent levels to such a, a, an extent that it will become challenging for, for, for um, tenants to, to sustain uh, their tenancies in that context. If, you, if, if I may add, because uh, Mr Simpson, you also asked about mechanisms. There's a really good and powerful mechanism, and that is tenant consultation. It's, it's part of that. And, and, and I think what we see is that good and responsible landlords consult in detail, properly on subjects like this, and come forward with options and get into a real dialogue with their tenants around things like rent increases and costs and value for money and so on. And so there is a mechanism whereby that in type of information that I talked about earlier that, that the, the regulator can provide can open that dialogue up around this area. And let me say, when, when we talk about consultation, we mean real options and real dialogue with tenants. We don't mean a nice letter. Can I just check briefly what evidence there is that that's happening? Um, I have an opportunity, Mr Walker, to, to meet you a short while ago where I asked a very similar question, which was in relation to when rent policies go to the board for approval, whether it's one option goes to the board and it's voted through on the nod because that's the culture within that housing association or whatever, or whether an options paper goes to the board based on consultation with tenants and residents, and then there's an open dialogue and a decision is made based on that options paper. In other words, the board itself are actually empowered to choose option A over option B over option C, rather than you can have your rent increase as long as you go for the one that's on the table, all say yes now. So it's that kind of culture. Is there any data collected where that, that, that does or doesn't happen? We um, published our thematic inquiry on um, how social landlords consult tenants about rent increases just about this time last year. 
um, and we found that some landlords um, absolutely engage with their tenants in a very meaningful way, in a, a constructive way, where they present uh, options and choices uh, and have the, the type of dialogue that, that George has referred to. Um, but we also found others that, that need to do more. Um, we made a series of recommendations um, to, to landlords and we'll plan to follow up on that thematic inquiry um, in 2018 to, to see what landlords are doing differently to consult with their tenants. Um, we also get feedback from our national panel um, and that does indicate that um, many uh, of the participants have received information and proposed uh, rent increases from their landlord and that they were uh, invited to provide their views, although there was a bit uh, more of a mixed picture on, on how clear and, and genuine they necessarily felt the process always was. Final thing I would say on this is that we um, we um, very much look to um, the significant performance failures route as a way for tenants to raise concerns with us where they feel that there isn't a genuine rent consultation exercise happening and indeed we've had one or two um, such um, significant performance failures reported to us by tenants. That's helpful. That we've got about 10 minutes or so left for questions if there are additional ones. No one had caught my eye, but I see I've missed the bid from Alexander Stewart to ask a question. I do apologise. Uh, thank you, Convener. In, in the report, you, you go into some detail about risk uh, and the risk assessments that you have. And you, you, know, you have a risk committee, uh, you have a, a risk framework, a risk task force, a, a risk plan. Uh, all of that sounds very good and uh, gives confidence that, that you are, are tackling the issue. But also within the report, you talk about some low uh, risk areas that you that you found that were prioritised, uh, and also what would be and what can be the greatest uh, risk issues to you as an organisation going forward. So, when you're just to clarify, uh, Mr. Stewart, when you're asking that, you, you're asking risk in terms of us as a regulator, or risk as we see it in the outside world? Because there's two parts to yeah, how we I, look at risk. I would I would suggest both really okay. uh, come into come into the context. Okay. Well, let me let me suggest. Shall I make some comments on how we look at risk for us as an organisation? But risk, of course, goes out into the risk assessments we do of RSLs themselves. And indeed, we just signed off the the process for the coming year for that at our last but one board meeting. And I'll, I'll maybe have Michael comment on, on that aspect if I can. The, f the first thing to say, I, I'm, I'm happy to report that w when I turned up at, at uh, SHR, I found a very well um, defined and in place risk management process. And I was happy to see that. Um, the, we have a risk register. In fact, we reviewed it yesterday. We had a board meeting yesterday and we went through that in some detail. Um, we set risk action plans for those, those risks that we deem higher to us as an organisation. Our management team then reviews that on a monthly basis. Our uh, audit and risk committee reviews it quarterly. And then, in fact, um, we have a major risk workshop as a board. Now, as a new chair, I haven't been part of that, that yet uh, each year. So we have a very um, clear way of managing risk for us as an organisation. But as I said, risk and risk assessment, of course, goes into the world of RSLs as well. And I'll maybe get Michael to comment on that aspect for you. Yeah, and, and every year we undertake an extensive assessment of the risk um, that we see in each um, uh, registered social landlord and in each local authority landlord we do that along with um, our partner scrutiny bodies through the shared risk assessment um, but in relation to to the registered social landlords that's an annual exercise we do uh, where we um, come to a view on what we see as the principal risks um, to um, Principally to our um, ability to protect and uh, safeguard the interests of tenants. Um, so ne not necessarily the same risks that uh, a landlord might have on its own risk register. Um, and um, this year, um, a number of risks that we have identified, some we've already spoken about. Um, around rent levels and affordability, um, welfare uh, reform and the impact that that will have on landlords' um, uh, income streams. Um, the, the fact that more landlords are uh, building more houses, getting back into development, and that in itself brings uh, a range of, of risks as well as all the opportunities 
um, um, that, that that brings. Um, we're also um, you know, still still uh, very focused on some of the other um, challenges that there are to um, RSL's financial uh, capacity, in, in particular around risks in uh, pension liabilities uh, and the impact that they can have uh, on an individual landlord. So we look at that full range of risks out in landlords' operating environment. Uh, and we come to a view uh, on the level um, of risk that each um, landlord has. Uh, and then we um, uh, construct an appropriate engagement uh, for every landlord. Now, that, that we then publish uh, in our regulation plans um, what that engagement will be. And last year, we, we had just shy of about um, 60 regulation plans. So we're engaging uh, through this year with around about 60 landlords where we've identified potential areas of risk. Fraud, uh, and we, we've touched on whistleblowing. That's obviously something that you've that you've dealt with in the past, uh, and and the and the whole idea of uh, anti-bribery, all of that has come into the the fore uh, in recent times. Uh, and and you're identifying, and you have a, a policy going forward to to manage that. Uh, th that's very much um, a part of regulatory standards mm -hmm. um, and we expect all um, landlords to comply with regulatory standards and to uphold the, 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 the kind of um, highest standards of, of behaviour and ethics within their organisation uh, and we will absolutely respond uh, where we find any instances of, of failure to comply with those with those standards and um, you know, we, we have done so in the recent past in a number of the statutory interventions we've had. Now, there's no other bits for questions, but there's definitely a couple of things I just want to get on the public record before we close this evidence session. So we just have a brief mopping up exercise just for five minutes. So I'll try to make the questions brief, but brief answers, if possible, would be helpful. Um, Mr. Mr. Stewart mentioned risks to uh, your own organisation, of course. And the report notes we are a smaller... We are smaller, have frozen recruitment throughout 15 and 16 to respond to reduction in our funding. We've also made savings in, in our other administrative costs wherever possible. All public bodies face funding pressures in the coming years. Our revenue budget for 17-18 is 3.8 million. It would be remiss not to ask about how you're getting on managing that budget, required efficiency savings, that kind of thing. Opportunity, Mr Walker or Mr Cameron, to put something on the record in relation to that. Short and quick uh, uh, for that. Um, we uh, did our half-year review uh, this week, uh, looked at that. We believe that we will come in on budget in line with that 3.8 million that we discussed. It's fair to say that as a regulator, we've taken out about a million pounds, uh, or sorry, our budgets have been, have been reduced by about a million pounds, and we've taken out significant costs over the last five years. However, I do need to say that 80% of our costs are staff-based. And although I said we will come in in line with our budget, that's because we're running a number of vacancies. So uh, it would be I, I, it would be a concern that that, that we have. Uh, I have I have to say, I, I don't believe there's any real fat left to trim when 80% of your costs are staff costs. When your staff have reduced from around 80 to around 50, you can see that those moves have been significant. And so I suppose uh, as we move forward to the spending review, uh, certainly that is on the board's minds as to how we would respond. And of course, we will respond appropriately once we see the outcome of that spending review. Certainly, we have engaged with that, have engaged with officials and with the minister, and uh, we're certainly com comforted that they're aware of, of our issues, uh, which is helpful. What the outcome will be, of course, is, is for others to decide, not us. OK, of course, it's very good that that's put on the record here today, um, because that's obviously in the public interest. Uh, you mentioned one of the risk factors was the Scottish Government's target of 50,000 new affordable homes over the lifetime of, of, of this Parliament. Significant challenge for housing associations and local authorities to deliver on that task. A lot of that comes down to corporate governance and ability to manage large projects, sometimes for the first time after a number of years for some of them. How content are you that the housing association movement and local authorities are well placed to deliver that target in terms of their ability to manage those kind of projects? I'll let, I'll let Michael take that one, actually. OK. okay. Um, well, it, it, it's absolutely been something that we've had a, a strong focus on over the last um, couple of years. And you may be aware that one of the organisations that we had to use our statutory intervention powers in um, got into trouble um, because it got back in 
to building houses after a significant period of time and, and didn't have the capacity to manage that effectively. Um, partly in response to that, um, but also recognising that the, um, the, 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 the target is there and that more landlords are getting back into developing um, and building new houses. Uh, we did a thematic inquiry um, last year where we published um, uh, what has been a very well received set of principles um, to guide um, uh, landlords um, through um, their um, implementation of development programmes. Um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on whether that is having the type of impact that we would want it to have. Um, and this is absolutely um, high on our risk agenda uh, in terms of that assessment process we go through for every single landlord. That's a positive thing. It's obviously good that landlords are back in the business of, of building affordable homes, but it has to be managed and delighted the housing regulator is keeping a close eye on that. Final question, just to make sure we've got a balance to our, our questioning in this evidence session. We've heard a bit about engagement with, with RSLs uh, a lot in the governance category in relation to that engagement. Are you able to just a little bit more about that? But just as importantly, not just the reasons for engagement in governance, the governance category, but how you're seeking to improve practice and build capacity. You raise a matter that is very important and, and very dear to our hearts at, at the regulator. Because in the main where we are having engagement, and I talked about engaging on, with one in eight RSLs around issues of governance, we talked about uses of statutory intervention uh, seven in the last three years, and in the main they have been about governance that hasn't been as effective as we would have liked it to be. This will be a very significant theme as we go through a regulatory framework review. Uh, we're already looking at issues around governance because we absolutely believe good governance is the core to that. And so we're now looking at some of the building blocks of good governance around areas such as internal audit, whistleblowing we've touched on, but really getting into the, the meat of that. And indeed, I'll be talking about a quite, quite a major conference around this subject of governance on Friday. So it's a very important area for us. I'll maybe see if Michael has something to add, because of course, as a regulator over the last five years, the fact I'm talking about it being a high profile thing, I don't want to lead you to believe there's not been a lot of activity going on in that regard currently. But but make no mistake, it, it is a challenge. Yeah. I mean, just, just to add to that, that um, where we engage with a landlord using our statutory intervention powers, um, we will publish a, a report and an account of that engagement when it is concluded. Um, and uh, that, that one of the important purposes of that type of reporting is to give all landlords an insight into what went wrong um, and to give them an opportunity to review their own approaches to ensure that they can learn any lessons that there may be coming out of that. Uh, we've published two such reports. Um, we've just concluded a third statutory intervention, so we'll be moving shortly to publish a third report. And then we will look to draw broader lessons uh, out of, of those three um, um, situations um, to ensure that um, there are lessons learned both by the sector itself, um, but also whether there's anything that we need to take out of that. And as George says, that will feed into the review of the regulatory framework. Thank you very much. Um Time is upon us. Uh, Mr Walker, Mr Cameron, thank you very much for attending here today. Very worthwhile evidence session for ourselves. If we'd normally see additional comments, please uh, do email the clerking team if there's something you really wanted to convey to us. You feel you've not had the opportunity to do that, but hopefully you've, you've had that opportunity. So thank you for attending, and we now have to move directly on to agenda item three. Thank you. So we now move to agenda item three, and the committee will uh, consider a negative instrument 350 is listed on the agenda. The instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on a motion to annul the instrument. Uh, no motion to annul has been laid. I uh, can invite members to make any comments they may have on the instrument before us uh, today. Uh, there being no comments, can... Uh, I ask members whether they agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments. Are we agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and we now move to agenda item four, which is previously agreed will be in private session. Thank you. <laughs>